Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Beyond Talking Points with Matt and Matt. Um, today, we have a, a bit of a different episode than usual. Usually, we have like one or two topics that we both feel pretty strongly about, or at least we have some thoughts on. And um, then we just kind of discuss about, discuss them for like half an hour or so. Um, today's going to be slightly different. Um, there will still be a discussion, of course, but... Um, my friend here um, has been uh, listening to a lot of news in the past eight months, eight months or so, um, and he has he has a lot of thoughts um, about um, coronavirus, um, you know, and involving policy and and um, how we should be um, dealing with these kinds of things um, and and what that means for you know our relationship with government. Um, so I am, I am sort of here as the devil's advocate. I mean, I probably, I might disagree with most of what he says, but I'm not here to present my case as thoroughly as he is. Um, we will do a second episode where I present my case uh, as thoroughly as he will do in this episode. Um, for, but for the most part, I'm kind of, I don't have any notes. I'm going in re relatively ignorant. I'm just kind of going to be here to listen to what he says and, and maybe offer counterpoints or just have him clarify more. Um, and yes, yeah, so it might be a little longer of an episode than usual, but we think it'll be fun. Um, so Matt, uh, take it away. Yeah. And, and then before I kind of jump into my, I guess, before I jumped into like the thesis I have here uh, of my thoughts on the coronavirus and the government's response to it, I, I also want to say um, normally we don't really research things. And we, we normally talk a lot from like, I guess, our background of just knowing about things. Like when we talk about Jordan Peterson, we'll watch the hour lecture, but we don't then like follow up on all the things they cite. Now, th this has pretty much been, I listen to a stupid amount of news because I have a desk job that allows me to sit there with my headphones in and just burn through stuff. And I've just picked up things that I find important. And sometimes I feel like it's overlooked and people aren't thinking critically about it correctly. So this is my conclusion. I will say... We don't super heavily edit this podcast, which you probably know if you are a regular listener. Um, so there might be times where I'm actually like shuffling through papers or grabbing my phone to try to cite something better. So bear with me a little bit because we haven't done that many heavily researched episodes. So I just wanted to, to um, say that from the start. But to dive in, I guess the basic thesis that I have here is that in general, in, in terms of the coronavirus, the government should be taking no action that is expanding government um, in order to combat the epidemic we're facing. Uh, and a few of the main general lines of thought I'm going to be pursuing are, or, or reasons for this, is because it is unclear if the coronavirus is quote unquote defeatable. Um, and it's unclear if unilateral lockdown policies are sustainable. Um, also, that policies need to look at several variables as opposed to only thinking about minimizing coronavirus cases. And then we may be using, in general, invalid metrics to either be measuring coronavirus or looking at the significance of events that are occurring. Um, and that, I think that's kind of to be one of the most extensive fields of thought is looking at a lot of things that are cited and why and which things we should actually be looking at or what matters. And then I would come to the conclusion that informed consent, when people take action um, in, in their own right, is really the most effective plan, uh, especially with something as complex as coronavirus that affects people in tons of different ways. You really do have to leave it to the people's um, hands because all the policies we have are far too blunt from what we understand. So that's the big starting point. Um, I think... If we want to start in one of the subtopics, maybe we'll start um, smaller um, and maybe in a more, I guess, in my mind, factual way of looking, a more factual, not as opinion based. And I think that's talking about if the coronavirus could even hypothetically be like, quote unquote, defeatable. Um, do you think that's an OK place to start? OK, so as, as we've you know known about this virus for about eight months at this point, um, from the beginning, the policy that was put into place was this two-week lockdown period that ended up lasting longer or shorter in different places um, and such and such that it devolved into local policies in different states and regions. 
But I actually kind of question if the coronavirus could even hypothetically be defeated. Um, so a lot of recent information that points in that direction that we couldn't simply like, I guess, eradicate it is when we've looked at a lot of the vaccine trials that have been occurring and how there's this idea that there could be a vaccine for coronavirus, but there's also the idea that the vaccine would have to be like a flu shot where you have to get one every year um, because the coronavirus is actually something that you would not necessarily get immunity to. There was recently a study that came out this last week and it came over from, uh, I want to say the UK, um, some, somewhere in Europe at, at the least in that vicinity. And they pretty much tested the antibody um, count in people who had coronavirus. And they found that the over a span of time, like a few months from when they initially got it and then were tested again a few months later, their antibodies had been reduced. So we're actually not sure about the long-term immunity people will get from coronavirus, um, like uh, for from having it, like how long they'll be immune. And we're not really sure if vaccines will be things that have to keep being re-upped every certain amount of time, or if it's really just you mostly get it once and then you're good. Um, and then the few times it's been documented that somebody already has had coronavirus twice, it's because the first time they were asymptomatic. Um, so they tested positive for whatever reason they were tested, um, even though they had no symptoms and they tested positive, but they didn't have any symptoms, but then they were able to actually get it again later. And the thinking there is when you don't have symptoms, your body doesn't create as many antibodies. So maybe your defense, your natural defense isn't immune to the coronavirus for very long. So um, one of the reasons I bring all this up is because when we talk about a lockdown, um, we I, I think it's pretty clear that even if you have a strict lockdown and you did it for even, say, a month, the disease wouldn't be gone from the world, even if you locked down everything for a month. That's not how any disease in human history has worked. We can eradicate things by having very, very effective vaccines, and then peop and then those diseases are slow to mutate. But if you lock everybody in their house for three weeks, transmission will drastically re be reduced, but it won't go away. It will still be out there. And if you have something that's fairly contagious, whenever you reopen again, the numbers of people who get it and are transmitting it will increase because that's the whole one-to-one, -one, the, the, the transmission um variable is like greater than one to one. If you have it, you're on average going to give it to like one and a half people. So the lockdown, since it won't eradicate it, the number will just continue to grow again. So I guess what I'm trying to lay out is we can't simply defeat it by waiting it out for a vaccine, or we don't know we can defeat it by waiting out for a vaccine. And if you lock down and you don't eradicate it, it's going to start going around again. So lockdowns aren't necessarily a great policy because they're not very sustainable. And it's not even clear that if we locked down until a vaccine came out, that would even be a great plan because we don't know how effective those things will be. And the, the disease won't just go away just because we reduce transmission by a lot. It will just pick up again whenever we unlock down. Um, so that, that that's my first broad thought. So, if you, so, so, let's, so you can jump in a little bit and let me know what you're thinking. Um, I guess the first thing that comes to my mind um, has to do with um, the, the fallibility of um, medicine and of doctors. Um, do doctors are not perfect, um, and the, the, pra the profession they practice is not perfect. Um, neither are just scientists in general and, and researchers and virologists. Um, and so I, I think, uh, some, some, I, I don't mean to, well, I, I don't want to try to get, I don't, I don't want to go down a, a media <laughs> rabbit hole, but I'm just going to say something, um, to, to connect it to a broader point. But, um, I, I get the sense that, um, when one study comes out, um, by a group of researchers, um, the media is quick to um, grab that um, study and report on it. Um, but I think we need to we need to realize that that's not how the scientific method works. Um, we we there have been even professionals have given conflicting or confusing information um, about the whole pandemic. Um, and 
I think part of that has to do with media sensationalizing certain things, or part of it just has to do with um, that there are a lot of unknowns um, when it comes to the coronavirus, and we need to be we need to be clear that there that um, <laughs> these unknowns exist, um, and that um, not no, no action we take is guaranteed to um, work completely or, or um, work flawlessly. Um, the other thing that came to my mind, um, and I wish I, I, I wish I had like the countries, um, written down or something. I think one of them might be New Zealand. Um, but there have, there do appear to have been, um, a couple countries where they locked down for a certain period of time and, um, they either reduced the, um, the, uh, reduced the amount of COVID cases drastically or in a few places um, got rid of it completely. Um, so, so what, what do you, um, w w what, what would you say to someone who might say, well, you know, on the news, I heard that um, this country got rid of COVID completely and they did it by shutting down for two months. Um, you can comment also on the other point about the, the, um, uh, how uh, the scientific method and, and, and medicine and whatnot is, isn't perfect, but um, yeah. So, so, so quick thoughts on, I guess, the part about the media and how they interpret science. I definitely agree that a lot of studies, like you'll take one study and it won't be replicated and it's just like, oh, they found this and that'll be pumped into the news as if that's now fact. And it's like, well, obviously we haven't had a month to digest it. This came out in the last week. Um, but, but there's a lot that's pointing to like how coronavirus, it seems to be constantly evolving, how there looks like there's a strain that was more prevalent in the United States and Europe versus the one that was um, more likely in China and how some uh, one strain was more deadly than the others. And that, a lot of that is also what kind of leads into why I don't think it can be defeated because it seems like most evidence um, look points to the disease can or, you know, um, the coronavirus can evolve to some extent. So what makes us think that this type of um, illness could be treated and eradicated like we could with smallpox when we still have, you know, the flu. Um, so is it closer to being something that can evolve like the flu or is it closer to something that just won't evolve and you give your kids it once and then they won't get it? And it seems more likely that it's going to be a, a, a long-term fixture. So then to uh, talk about, so like countries that lock down and now they're not seeing huge amounts of coronavirus. So I guess I would say a lot of those countries are very small countries and it seems that they didn't have a large amount of coronavirus cases by the time they were on alert. Um, this gets kind of tricky when you talk about the United States, because there are a lot of experts who think coronavirus was in the United States a lot longer before we started reporting it. Because there are people who think in certain South American countries that they had things that lined up with coronavirus months ago, like, like months before our lockdowns, like late 2019. Um, and there are people who speculate um, that, gosh, I wish I remembered this off the top of my head. I didn't think it would come up, but it was a state like West Virginia had very, very, very low cases at first. And it's because the people who worked in the hospital systems there were saying that there were very high cases of what seems to now be coronavirus there, like, like four months before it was even really on our radar. So I, I guess I would say a lot of these countries that are like small Nordic countries, they, it doesn't appear that they had a population that was large. So they were able to lock down and they were able to quarantine specific people. And then they were kind of able to stunt it. And they also like haven't reopened for immigration and they've still kept pretty strict rules, relatively speaking. I mean, you, you see some videos where some places are pretty open, but um, it seems like they're, they were fairly strictly locked down for a while. And it's not like they're that they're being very, very, very strict about who they let in the country. So it's kind of like, is that sustainable for, you know, the rest of existence to keep their population ever away from this disease? Um, so, can, so could I jump in here with one quick question? Yeah. Um, I, I just want a point of clarification. So is your criticism of the, um, how the effectiveness, the effectiveness of, of the lockdown, is that dependent then on, on the fact that the U S is just such a large country? Well, so, 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 so the other point I'd make about that small country where like nobody's gotten it. So, so, so in the end goal, well, what you want is you want 
people to have antibodies to the disease and preferably preferably in the ideal universe, we'd want to get there without people actually having to get the disease because it's not good if people get a disease if they don't have to. So if you think about these Nordic countries where nobody really got it at all and there was never really a bad spike, then there's not an amount of people who will have antibodies to it. So you're either going to have to not have immigration really to any capacity that could risk putting their population in jeopardy, or you have to wait till there's an effective vaccine, but we might not ever really have an effective vaccine. So you might not, you might have this population of people, much like people who are in the Americas before Europeans went there, who are really susceptible to a disease because none of them have ever been in contact with it. So I, I guess what I'd say is they're not really in the safe zone if none of them have antibodies. And if they lock down early and never got it, it's like, that's fine, but the rest of the world has it. So could you really call what they have successful right now just because people don't have it right now? So I'd look at it from like this multi-year long way of thinking is, does it seem like they're actually going to be able to get antibodies without getting it? Because if they can, they'll be very hyper successful. But at some point, they're going to probably interact with people from other countries, and that might cause the pandemic to come to them because if none of them have immunities, you know what I mean? And um, at this point, we think that there can be people who are um, carriers of it that would be asymptomatic. And not every test has a great positive. Um, it, it, not every test is 100 percent, you know, effective. And usually they only retest people if they have a reason to think you might have coronavirus and then you give it, get a result that they don't expect. So if you don't have any symptoms and say they're screening you and they give you a test and then you test negative, but you're a non, um, what's the word, an asymptomatic person. Like eventually I could see that kind of person go into one of those countries and then nobody has antibodies. And then all of a sudden you start over with having to relock down if you don't want those people to ever obtain it, unless you wait out till there's an effective vaccine. So I, I guess I wouldn't even say that kind of response is necessarily good because you're not progressing towards any kind of group immunity to the virus. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, the United States being large is a huge problem in terms of why lockdowns would be less effective, because at least you can get this pseudo efficacy from a small country. From a large com country, you're really just lagging the timeline and um, locking everybody down. But it really just pushed things back. So it kind of delayed it. But since there wasn't any tangible progress, and I had to make the argument that there can't really even necessarily be a lot of tangible progress, it didn't really matter. We kind of just locked down and pushed the timeline on everything back a few weeks, which is bad. Um, yeah. So j j if you have more thoughts on that, feel, feel free, because I dumped a lot on you. So... Um, I, I guess I'm a little... I, I need a little more um, about, um, I guess, how you're viewing um, effectiveness or ineffectiveness in this situation. I mean, if a country at this moment, you know, uh, October 28th, 2020, um, if they are coronavirus free, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, coronavirus is defeated overall. Um, but, but that means that that community, um, is safe. That community is, um, at least, at least for the time being, um, that, that community, uh, has for some, some re for some reason, um, got, um, out of the equation, um, or out of the, they, they, um, they're not on the, they're not on the field. Um, they're not, they're not in the, um, Trying to think of, I don't remember what the boxing. Uh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, they're no longer uh, players in in that respect. Um, I, I guess I need a little more about that. I'm I'm no, still confused. So, so so I think I agree with you. I, I guess what I'm saying is you're right. It looks effective right now, but the problem is like if one country has nobody who has antibodies, right? Because nobody's had it. And then we aren't getting particularly close to a vaccine that we know will actually be effective in the long term. At some point, you'd think that country um, would interact with people from other countries or else they at least have to. They, they could be open internally, but maybe they'll have to be locked down internationally. So you can argue that, that what they're doing is on paper very effective right now, but it's still they're 
having the lockdown from people who have had it in the past or could be potential carriers because your society is way more vulnerable because nobody has any, anti any antibodies. So if I walked in a room and say I had coronavirus, but 20 people in that room all had um, antibodies, then it doesn't really matter that I have coronavirus because all of them are immune, at least temporarily, because maybe they just all had it a week ago. So may maybe all those people are immune. So, but then say if I walked in was asymptomatic as far as I knew and I tested negative and then I go into the Netherlands and then nobody there has antibodies because nobody's had it um, and they've just been completely locked down and the small amount of cases that have had it have immediately been separated from their families, put in a hotel room and quarantined. Then anybody I interact with, I'm much more likely to give it to them because they've had no immunity at all because they've been so stringent. So the fact that a lot of people in the United States have had it, and probably a lot more people than we know in the United States have had it, there might be a level of immunity that means one carrier is less likely to transmit it to, say, five people and would be more likely to transmit it to one person. But then if you ended up in a country that had been locked down, well locked down, and they don't catch you, then maybe you'll accidentally contaminate 15 because nobody has any antibodies. And that could be very bad. So it's like, yeah, it looks good, but they're not really out of the dark. You know, they're kind of still in peril because as currently they don't have any kind of immunity in terms of on a societal level, in terms of the average person. And when you start breaking down statistics like, OK, if I interacted with somebody with coronavirus and I have no antibodies, what are the odds I get it? Well, and then people interact with so many people in a day. Well, if like 20 percent of those people have antibodies, then the amount of people who actually end up getting contaminated from you might average be like 0.7. And if the average is less than one person you're giving it to, then the disease is more likely to die out in a region. But if nobody has antibodies and you're interacting in a way that would be more likely to give a person without antibodies coronavirus, and you don't have that reduction factor almost. That's like the argument for herd immunity. And that's the argument for why, you know, it's important for you and I to get vaccines um, on a, that's the argument that like somebody will make for compulsory vaccines and why your vaccine protects me. That's the kind of argument they make, right? It's because you can't be a carrier. Um, so that means you're less likely to get communicated to you. So it's less likely to be a societal problem because transmission will be stunted from the start. Um, so, yeah, I would say like, yeah, you could say you could argue they did good. And then that, that's another point that we're going to touch on when we talk about looking at things through the lens of several variables or which variables matter. You, you can make a case that's better because they're not dying right now. That's very valid. I'm just saying they're not really out of the dark. So they're really just perpetually locked down for maybe no reason if the virus, if there's not a good vaccine. So, so, so you're, you're, um, you're, you're, you'd seem to be making the argument that um, if a particular areas, particular countries are um, coronavirus free at the moment, um, that's only a, a temporary reprieve if, um, if humanity uh, as a whole, um, or if the majority of people as a whole haven't become immune to the virus, because you could still introduce it into that community. And then, um, and then, uh, you know, that would lead to, that could lead to de uh, more devastating effects. Is, is that kind of your yeah. thought process? Yeah. So, so, so in a way, at least on that nation's borders, they're pretty much going to have to be on coronavirus lockdown forever if none of the people ever get immunity there because anytime somebody comes in and could give it to 10 people then all of a sudden they have a real epidemic in their country that every that the u.s has already maybe partially gone through and that uh, and that's probably why we are seeing such a spike in cases at least right now um and that's i guess a topical thing we might end up touching on but a lot of people are getting it right now because people are finally allowed to go to restaurants in most of the part of the, so the country so people are finally doing things that are more social than before and a lot of people are getting you know, infected and probably getting antibodies and probably more people than we even realize because so many people are allegedly getting it asymptomatically. Um, and, th and that's something we'll probably, I'll probably talk in detail on in a little bit. Um, yeah, we can probably, I, we can probably move on to your next topic. Um, I just want to say earlier, I was trying to say they were out of the boxing ring. My brain just died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was trying to say. Uh, so I don't sound like a crazy person. I was trying to say these countries are out of the boxing ring. <laughs> yeah. You're Go good. You're good. Okay, um, okay, so let's, this one's a little more, um, I guess this one's one of the less technical ones. Um, so, so this is just, I wanted to bring up the idea that 
in general, policies need to look at several variables, especially when you're like measuring efficacy and success. And right now it seems like the main metric of success, if you turn on any kind of news outlet or you turn into any kind of briefing is about the number of cases. And I think talking about minimizing COVID cases as the main goal is a, I don't think that's an effective metric. Um, so I guess my reasoning would be one, uh, in a way it's arbitrary because we don't actually know how many cases there are. We know how many known cases there are. And there's a big difference um, because a lot of people, if they're allegedly asymptomatic, they aren't gonna go get tested unless they have a reason to. So we actually don't really know how many active cases there are. Um, so I, I throw that out there. The other thing is it makes it so we don't really look at the opportunity cost of any government action. So I guess the example would be, we talk about minimizing cases, look how good we're doing, they're minimizing cases, but we're not talking about like how bad um, certain societal trends are in response to say lockdowns or in response to, I guess, in general, the shutting down of a lot of things. So like um, if you look at some information polling of young people or, or, or just uh, people in general, like I have this, uh, there was a CNN report from August that said one in four young people are reporting suicidal thoughts, which was like a huge uptick from year, year over year. And um, there, there's been a lot of polls about mental health in general. And a lot of this is also because there are a lot of young people overestimate, or, or if, if you ask them what their expectation is of, I guess, surviving coronavirus, they will give you numbers that are skewed very high relative to their population. So a lot more people are afraid of the coronavirus, which isn't good on their mental health. And a lot of that's kind of been perpetuated by a lot of the policies about like how kind of scared we need to be or how many precautions we need to take. And I'm not saying the precautions are invalid, but by talking up security to the extent that we have, we make it seem like everybody is in somewhat imminent danger, which isn't really true for, mo for large populations of um, the United States. So you have a lot of these people who are now suddenly out of jobs. Um, so you've seen huge upticks of people who have had suicidal thoughts in poor people or people have lost their jobs or people in the lower income spectrum. Even for people who are like upper middle class, if they lose their job, upper middle class people are more likely to be leveraged and more debt in terms of like housing and stuff like that. So they're not faring well if they lose their jobs. And a lot of this has been in response to the coronavirus combined with the, the government's um, response to coronavirus. And I'm not saying restaurants would still be in business if the government do, didn't do anything. A lot of restaurants would still go under. But I would say a lot of really blunt lockdown policies and a lot of really blunt state policies have probably closed down more stuff than would have happened if people made their own decisions of what they were willing to tolerate in terms of risk. And if you let people say, okay, I'm comfortable because I understand my um, I understand my risks, I'm still willing to go do this, then that place could maybe still do business. But when you have like a state, like say we are making this thing illegal completely for this many months, that company goes, well, we can't afford rent and now we have to go under and then everybody gets fired. So there's been a lot of events like that where it's like, I'm not saying there wouldn't be economic devastation from even a free market response to coronavirus because there would be economic devastation, but I'm saying a lot of blunt policies have perpetuated that. And that flows into a lot of things like, cause the great depression I and mean, the great recession had huge spikes in suicides. And the, the, there is like a shorthand stat that is out there that I don't know off the top of my head, but it's about how um, unemployment coincides with suicide rates and how those things interact. So I, I guess what I would say is there's a lot of stuff about quality of life that isn't being taken into account when the only thing we talk about is minimizing COVID cases. And I don't think that is um, intellectually satisfying in any way. And I think it's really crude in terms of thinking. Um, it's very narrow. I mean, well, it's, it's very blunt, it's too broad. So go Do for you it. No. Um... This is more of a factual question. Mm -hmm. I don't know off the top of my head. What What are the researchers saying um, in terms of uh, known cases versus unknown cases? Oh, okay. I was going to come to that in a little bit. That's actually, I got something from the Wall Street Journal right here. This is from October 6th. So it's not that old. And um, okay. So th this was a, a quote from Dr. Robert Redfield. So he's um, head of, okay. 
Yeah, so he's head on the he's the head of the CDC. And he said our testing as of late June was picking up perhaps 10% of cases. When we say 40,000 new infections are occurring daily, we might really mean 400,000 infections. When we might imply that 2.2% of Americans have been infected, we really we may really mean 22%. So, yeah. The amount of people who might have it could be tenfold what we know. And like that hugely would affect the policy breakdown. But instead, we're relying on very obtuse policies that don't really take that into account. And and this is my other problem. And I don't have a lot of specific. And this is related to what you're saying. This is really related. This is a huge gripe I have. And it, this is a rant that I need to go on. Um, it's all about te- it's it's about testing. And the reason why is that there is not a single person who can study the state of coronavirus testing in every single state and every single jurisdiction. But we compare these numbers as if they are apples to apples when they're not. Because certain states have 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 different requirements for when they test people, so and and different regions have different requirements for I guess um why why they might versus situations they might or versus what kind of employers are open that are testing people, so you could easily look at a random state and say look fifteen percent of people we give a test to test positive that's really bad and this state's doing better because only 3% of the people they're testing test positive. But they could have completely different diagnostics that go into you getting the test to see if you're positive or negative. So when we look at these things that are about active cases, we're looking at active known cases, but depending on the state's regulations for testing for coronavirus and when you do it and why, like you're gonna get completely different numbers because some states are being very proactive and some states report all the tests they get results for. But if one is testing way more random employees and one's only testing people that come to the hospital, then you're probably going to get huge distributions regardless of what's actually going on in that state, just because you're picking from different population groups within that state. So it's people are comparing these things like they're apples to apples. And it's easy. Obviously, there's a spike in this state versus this state. And they're drawing conclusions about where why masks are effective based on that kind of data. And it's like unless you can break down the testing regimes and and what kind of like way it's, the reasoning behind it in each state and what their access is to testing, you can't make these comparisons. They're unreasonable. Um, so that that's a big gripe I have with a lot of active case rates, too. And that's why I don't think it's a good metric. Um, well, you, you, there's a lot there. Um, I guess I'll focus um, at first. We, we'll return to um, uh, problems with statistics and and yeah, we, we uh, definitely having, are going to talk about a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah, states having different policies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I wanted to um, begin to talk about um, the other point you mentioned, which is the costs of shutting down the the, the economy, shutting down. Um, restaurants and bars and, and telling people to uh, stay in for a certain period of time. Um, and I wanted to talk about it because I was actually listening to a, a radio program. Um, it was a, it was actually, it, would, it was originally a radio program somewhere in the UK, but I found it, found it on YouTube and it was all about, um, the coronavirus and how it relates to the economy and the cost benefit analysis that goes into all of that. Um, and it even talked about economists, um, that specialize in basically putting a price on people's lives. (laughs) I mean, it sounds callous, but it, it, there's a reason for it, you know, understanding, um, the, the, uh, understanding, um, the cost of doing certain things or other things um, and and how that affects other people um, and how much we need to be concerned with other people um, versus how much can we just not control and we just have to accept a certain amount of risk. I think I'm, am I making sense? Um, Okay. Just just making sure. So it's an important conversation to have because um, I agree with you that um, lockdowns are not, they, they cannot be sustained forever and they probably can't be sustained for very long. Um, that there are just too many, um, other social factors, um, which, uh, limit, um, 
our ability to be in quarantine um, for long amounts of time. Um, I don't think, and I really haven't seen the evidence of people like, oh, we have to be in lockdown forever now until until you know Jesus Christ comes back or whatever. <laughs> I don't really hear the people uh, who who are going that extreme. I think most people would say at some point we have to cut it off and go back to semi-normal life. Um, I, I think the question is, or what I would need to be convinced on is that, um, kind of goes back to what well, the whole how we started the conversation in the first place is. I'm not actually convinced that um, that shut down that, that, that shutting down um, society um, is necessarily a bad thing, um, or that it's necessarily not effective given our circumstances, <clears throat> um, because uh, to to a certain extent, um, and this is almost. I'm going to try to stop myself before I begin to get into social contract territory, <laughs> but um, to to a certain extent, I, I think we do need to make sacrifices for the benefit of the community. Um, we, we might have disagreements on what those quote-unquote sacrifices are or when to do them or how to do them, um, but I, I don't think... I think in the in something like a pandemic, I think uh, the individualism that an anarcho-capitalist espouses really breaks down from my perspective. Um, and so I guess I'd like to get, hear a little more about um, your, your thoughts on all that. Yeah. Um, okay. So when we talk about society being on lockdown and how bad that really is, um, I was trying to pull up another article I had because it was, it was more specific about like the drastic rates of increase in essentially depression and things similar to depression because people can't do things anymore. Um, and I think that that's something that can't be glossed over. And it's one of the things that has had such a spike that it's like arguable that the coronavirus lockdowns is even having a real net positive effect if you look at a real time horizon. Because when you lock down for two weeks and there's not all of a sudden a vaccine two weeks later, then you're really just delaying the spread because the amount of I guess people who are immune in the system has not increased or changed even in a good lockdown. And you'd assume some amount exists because you literally can't lock down everything. You still have to have some people um, working at certain stores and you still have to be able to go to a grocery store. So you're still going to have some level of transmission and then people are still open to be you know, infected. So then that transmission will obviously increase whenever you decide to reopen. It's inevitable. You can't completely prevent transmission, so the numbers will always increase. So you're really just pushing back those increases. You're just saying, okay, well, we want to push it back. And then the other issue is the longer you do the lockdown, the less people abide by the rules and the more it loses pu public support. And this isn't really a thing that I, I guess this is where I think the lockdown theorists completely fall apart is it's easy to say, well, if we all lock down until we have a very effective vaccine, then no more people really have to die because we pretty much stunt transmission, even though there's still be a small amount, and then everybody gets something that makes them immune. But the reason that doesn't work is because, as, as you'll hear pretty much any very far left-wing person on Twitter say, is they say, if we really lock down for two weeks and follow the rules, this wouldn't be the problem. And this is the problem of the people who are in the red states that don't take it seriously. And what I would say is, no, that, that, that's not the issue at all, um, because the two-week lockdown doesn't eradicate the disease. It would still transmit at a more than one-to-one -one person ratio, whether you're taking all the precautions or not, and you don't have a surefire fix. So all you've really done is delayed it. Um, so, yeah. And then if you say, well, it's just those people in the red states, it's like even in places that are very liberal after several months of being locked down, people would would stop following all the rules. That's why in like places that are seen as like, like, like in California, which is thought of as like a liberal bastion, um, people got their water shut off and their utilities shut off because they were having parties and the government found out they had a party and they threatened to shut off their utilities. And they did. And pretty much what I'm saying is there isn't a society where you could, would actually be able to convince people to fully lock down. So if you say, but if we did, it's like, okay, but you're existing in a sandbox of your imagination where people won't do that unless you threaten to shoot them if they walk outside. So I, I guess what I'm saying is 
whether you're ideologically skewed that way or not to think people should follow the rules. Once you get a long enough time of lockdown, people get lockdown fatigue and don't follow the rules. Um, and th there's also this other bad thing that happens with lockdowns where if the rates seem low, even though that's a good thing, it makes people go, now I don't need to be, I don't need to take any precautions because the rate's really low. And that's part of what restarts the cycle of, and then people who don't have immunity since nobody got immunity now get it because people aren't as worried because the rates were really low, but it's still a, con a contagious thing that we didn't eradicate. So I would say a lot of the things with lockdowns are based on a false sense of security. Um, it looks more secure than it is, but really pushes off the problem. And then um, it doesn't really work in practice because nobody actually completely abides by the rules because people aren't willing to. And it's like, do I wish they would? Maybe, but they just aren't. People just stop obeying them after a few months. So you just, you can't even really say they should because they won't. You know what I mean? Is that fair? Um, I, I need another point of clarification. So from my perspective, um, I think uh, kicking the can down the road um, can be helpful if, um, if the vaccine that they create is... Uh, is quite beneficial. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean the vaccine has to cure coronavirus for all time, but it has to be um, effective to enough to where immunity. it has to be effective enough to where the the virus numbers, the cases go down, and we start uh, the, the public health begins to get back to or close to where it was before. But I guess what I hear you saying is. I guess you disagree with it because it's ineffective or do you disagree with it at a more fundamental level? So I'm saying it could be, so I'm not even making the ANCAP arguments just because that's a non-starter with our ideological predispositions. I'm making a consequentialist argument against it. I'm not even basing off liberty or anything. I'm just saying it could be effective in terms of limiting spread for a few weeks, but like there were a bunch of charts of people's anonymized cellular data that showed as the longer the lockdown went on, people started leaving their house a lot more. So what I'm saying is in practice, you tell people to stay at home and you can show that even if the rules don't change, people stop caring after a certain point. Even if things are closed, they still start going and doing things more. And those things make the lockdown ineffective. And then I also think there's no reason to assume a vaccine will be as effective to the degree that we're hoping it is. Because in practice, it appears based on the evidence that's out there that coronavirus is more likely to be something that has multiple strains and could somewhat adapt then it is something that you could just take a vaccine and be good. Um, and, and it seems like immunity isn't necessarily permanent. So if you're staking it all on people abiding by a lockdown for a long amount of time and the immunity being very good for a long amount of time, it's like both those things are unlikely. People are going to stop abiding by the lockdown and people are going to, um, the, the, and like you don't want to hedge everything on the vaccine necessarily being very, very effective. Do you know, you might not know the answer to this question, I'm just curious, um, the studies you've you've uh, seen about um, people uh, disobeying a lockdown the longer the lockdown is, is that, um, are they doing that, are they looking at uh, behavior, human behavior across different countries, or are they focusing in the United States, or do you know, do you even know the answer to that? Most of the stuff I've looked at is in the United States, um, and the reason why most stuff I look at is in the United States is because when you observe things that are in different nations, then it's like, it just shows how obviously different nations should have different responses because it could be based on a country's culture. Because like, you could imagine that maybe like some European country like Germany maybe might be a lot more obedient to certain things than maybe California or Florida or something. So it's been a lot more United States based. And, it, and it's also tough to compare data across countries because you look at like Italy and one of the main reasons why people die there so much is because there's so many more smokers, their median age skews high and people are more likely to live with their grandparents. And it's like, those are three very important factors. So why would we compare any of their government decisions versus any other countries when other countries don't have those like very important factors? So most of what I've looked at is based around the United States. I only ask um, because I can't help but speculate that. Um, well, well, we'll get into, I guess, how how uh, how uh, bad or how, or how good the <laughs> the coronavirus um, pandemic 
has been in the United States and what we think about the numbers and all that stuff. But um, from my perspective or, or from what I've read about it, um, the numbers don't look good. The numbers don't look good at all. Um, at some level, it doesn't as I said in the last podcast, it doesn't matter to me if China's numbers are worse or Russia's numbers are worse and they're just reporting false numbers. It matters to me that the numbers in the U.S. are pretty bad. Um, now, okay, and I well, think one, one thing I, w- I would just want to say, though, uh, on that is um, if you compare states, though, like if you look at New York and New Jersey's debt mortality rate per 100,000 and you compare it to some other states that are like more innocuous that people don't talk about, though, those states have vastly, vastly higher mortality rates. And it, the, the more apt comparison for the U.S. is looking at like the whole like EU area. Because then you get places like Italy who handled it like hell, just like New York did in the beginning of March, right? And then they were also predisposed to be worse off because of things like how close people live together. And then you actually have like a fair way of looking at 50 different states by looking at all these countries together. And when you look, when you compare all of like that area's numbers against the U.S.'s numbers, they're relatively, they're, they're pretty close. And I'm not saying like, oh yeah, it's a hundred to, it's a hundred people off. But I'm saying it's not as off as you'd expect based on like the CNN coverage. I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying, and I, and I know you, I don't expect you to necessarily like believe that because you're taking my word for it because I haven't really heard that many people reporting that. But if we're going to start comparing the US to other countries, I think it's like kind of a fool's errand, and that's like I think that's the I, I, I don't really think the US is doing uniquely bad. Um, well, that's what I. That's where I'm not sure you're right or i'd need more evidence to think yeah, about that yeah, um or need more evidence to come to that conclusion um because um the, the, the whatever like the number that's being touted it was at two hundred and ten thousand or over, even over that now um like it's not a perfect number of course um and and different like i i accept that um states different states have different circumstances some might do a little worse a little better than others so, so some um, do a lot worse in terms some of do a lot worse and some do a lot better but um I, let me finish this quick point then i'll let you jump in um it, it does seem to me though that it, it does seem to me that the numbers however we're going to interpret them um they're they're, they're relatively uh, a, a good amount of deaths. Um, and of course the question I, I won't at the moment, I won't get into the question of whether like how much of that was preventable or not, but I just, I just, um, I have this little like hypothesis. Um, it's not really a testable hypothesis, but, um, I think, uh, if, if we assume, or if we, um, come to the conclusion that the U S hasn't done well or as well as it could have, I think some of that goes back to just cultural issues um, that the U.S. has. I think certain European countries, um, and again, I know you said it's a fool's errand to compare European countries, but bear with me for a moment. Um, European countries, in some ways, they have a slightly different uh, interpretation of government or a different relationship with government, um, and and I think that that probably leads to many more people following. <laughs> certain uh, orders about quarantine in like European countries than they would in the United States. Um, I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but, yeah, but that well, is definitely a thought that, I, that I've had. I, I think that it's, we're, we're so ingra- it's so ingrained in our culture to hate the government and to be suspicious of the government um, and to, you know, uh, scream about liberty. Um, <laughs> but, and I really, I appreciate though, by the way, I appreciate you haven't, uh, talk th- too much about that. You're, you're focusing on other things and talking about it in different ways, and I appreciate that. But I think a lot of this, um, pe- a lot of people um, dis- disregarding these rules, it does boil down to, well, I feel like the government's taking away my liberty, and I don't want that. Um, but then there's, of course, there's the question of, well, is that liberty that you're talking about in that situation in the middle of a pandemic, is that that much better than what we're doing now? And, and so these are a lot of questions that I kind of just threw out through at you, but um, no, no, I, I, I think it's a good a good place to continue the dis- a good way to continue the discussion. I, I like that you brought that up because it gives me the opportunity to hammer a point home that I think is important, and I think it's a point that a lot of technocrats get wrong. 
And I think this is also a point that why like a lot of central planning policies just don't work. What, 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 whether you value freedom or not, it's the reason why they don't work. And the reason they don't work is because you actually have to take that into consideration when you design a policy. So that, that, that's why you could say, here's what Germany did and it worked. And then you could say Trump should have done it. And then it's like, well, no, because lockdowns would be way, way more effective than in, say, Germany than in the United States because of different cultures. And you could you could say, well, maybe our culture shouldn't be this way, or maybe this is a point against our culture being this way, or maybe it'd be better if our culture acted in different ways or responded in different ways. But in the end, when you're designing policy, you work with the situation in front of you. And the situation in front of us is we have a country where a lot of people are like me, and they say, I I observe the government's actions with skepticism, and I feel like when they do things, they need a bar- they need to meet a very high barrier for me to accept it. And what, whether you agree with that line of thought or not, a lot of people think that way. And because people think that way, it in, innately hamstrings lockdown approaches. And you can't just whine and say, okay, well, I wish that I wish we just had a real lockdown. It's no, we live in a society that the lockdown, that option is off the table because people won't respect it. So it won't work. And although you could say that sucks and other countries lock down and it worked, it means it doesn't mean it would work here because you can't change societal values when you put the policy in and hit enter and get everybody to sign off on it. So it's like to some point you might be right, um, but I would say it's almost, it almost makes my case for me because it shows the lockdowns won't work here. And that, that shows that more lockdowns wouldn't have worked here. And then that, that's not the right way to react and say we didn't have enough lockdowns. That's wrong because it would have worked poorly. Um, so that's, that's the way that I've kind of conceptualized that. Um, I'm just going to throw out a really big question, slightly uh, uh, a slightly provocative question as well. And I'm just going to you can go you can roll with it in whatever direction you want. Um, what would you say? Like like what's the the human cost that we're willing to accept? If if um you know if I accept everything you said up to this point, or if some member of the audience accepts uh, everything you said up to this point, it's like okay, Matt. I'm becoming a bit skeptical of of um, the effectiveness of lockdowns in in the U.S. Um, or I just think are they ineffective uh, or all, all this stuff. Um, what would you say then to someone who's like, well, in that case, you just have to accept a lot of deaths? Um, do you, do you have a response to that, or do you not accept that uh, that question? Do you, are you suspicious that we'd actually have the amount of deaths that some some uh, some pro- pro- professionals uh, say we would, or, or what's your thought process in that regard? So w- when it comes to tolerance, I guess, for people getting the disease or dying from it, um, well, so so, so so the first point I'd probably make is I'd, I'd undercut the lockdown side by, 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 by just reiterating the point about how lockdowns a lot of times are pushing it off. So even if you say, well, during the lockdown, there's no deaths, it's like, yeah, but it's not stopping the ones immediately after, and it's not sustainable. You can't just lock down forever. So it's like, okay, that's not even really an option on the table to compare against. Now, what I would say is if you leave it to people to make their own individual decisions, you may have a different amount of deaths, but it is people who have proactively done things that have been, it's, um, it's informed consent. So I could look at the data as a 23 year old and I could say, okay, if I go to Disneyland, I'm going to be interacting with a lot of people in a place, but a lot of it's outside, but there are some inside rides that I might be somewhat near people, maybe four and a half feet away. And I know my health background. So maybe I'll be putting myself at a little more risk than I'd like to. Well, even though Disneyland's open, that doesn't mean I'll go to it if I'm uncomfortable with my own risk. So a lot of people who opt into these situations where they're more likely to be put at risk, like if they go to the White House Rose Garden celebration without masks, and there's a ton of people outside that they don't know, well, then maybe those people have done something that is knowingly based on the information more risky. And even if they do later die from it, it's they, they, they can evaluate their own health better than I can evaluate it for them. So I'd say even if people are dying, it is people who have self-selected into situations that have made them more likely to be at risk. Unlike the lockdown where you forcefully select everybody to be in a situation that is supposed to be minimizing risk, but is generally just minimizing short-term risk. Um, so like right now, if I was really concerned, if I was a person who was very worried about my health, the only time I'd probably leave my house would be to go to the grocery store. And if I go to the grocery store, I can take a lot of precautions just on my own end 
and I can go to grocery stores that I can tell are being pretty strict about coronavirus. If I go to a grocery store once and I see people aren't wearing their masks and it puts me off, then I'm going to go to like a Whole Foods that I know is probably just culturally going to be more strict on on coronavirus lockdowns. Um, But if somebody says, well, I want to go to the movies and the movies aren't going to be that crowded and I'm willing to sit in the movie theater, I don't see why they shouldn't have been allowed to do that six months ago. But they're just now being allowed to do that again in the last two months um, in terms of a legal basis. So I I would say there could arguably be more deaths, but people are pre-selecting into it. The other thing I would say is um, when we talk about the phrase herd immunity, which people have like an incorrect trigger negative reaction to because it implies that we want people to go get it and it'll be okay. It's like when you get vaccinated, you're building towards herd immunity because you, you, you're becoming, the population is becoming more immune to something. There's just two ways to reach it, by either getting the disease and being somewhat immune or getting the vaccine and being somewhat immune. So what I would say is if everybody's evaluating their own risk, then a lot more young people will probably give it to other young people. And I don't see why that's necessarily a bad thing as long as you are very aware of it. Because if you're very aware of it, then you just say, hey, 23 year old, that's my grandson, if you're doing risky things, I don't want to associate with you unless you stop doing risky things. And that sucks, but that that's a relationship decision you have to make with your family. It's not a decision that people should be making for you, really. And then you can go, okay, I'm being risky about it because I'm kind of okay with my health and I don't really think I'll get it. If I do get it, I'll probably be fine. It's like, that, that that's a fair decision. And that person may very well get it, be asymptomatic, and now increase that herd immunity. But if they're locked down, they might hate their life a lot more, not be allowed to make their own decision and not be raising that bar to get to herd immunity. The only times young people getting it is dangerous is when they're go get, get, getting it and then giving it to an old person or if they like had lymphoma when they were a kid. Um, so like if I got it, I don't think anybody should be concerned for me because I'm a very healthy 23 year old. So the odds of me even being hospitalized or really even knowing I had it are incredibly low. Um, so I, I guess that's that's my big picture response is people wouldn't, a lot of people could still be secure if they want to. You can still self-lock down. And if you're self-locked down, you're not leaving your house. So who's going to be giving it to you? Um, And then the people who are doing things that are now seem irresponsible to you might have higher risk tolerances and might be very healthy. And if that's, if they are, then I don't see why that's unreasonable. And it might even increase herd immunity. Um, So that might even be better for society. There's a case that it could be better for society if those people aren't at a high risk group and they won't die. So I think that's my, I know that's a lot. I apologize. I kind of just went off. No, you're fine. Uh, so did, did, does is, that make, did that make sense? I, I fall. Yeah, no, I followed you okay. completely. I followed you completely. So sometimes um, I don't know when I get in the zone and I, I, that sounds kind of arrogant in a way, but it's like, I'm just saying like the internalized reasoning here at this point. No, no, I followed you completely. Um, and this is almost, I don't know, this point is almost like abstract and philosophical, so we don't have to dwell on it too long. But are you sort of saying, or um, I guess the argument I, I hear you making is um, at some level we need to treat coronavirus cases as, um, or if you get it, Um, it might have been, um, it might have been due to your own irresponsibility. And I'm not trying to simplify your argument or saying you're saying everyone's stupid and dumb and, and you hate everybody. But, but, um, I I guess I, what I hear you almost saying or talking about is personal responsibility. Um, the, 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 the individual's responsibility to, um, uh, to 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 uh, figure out for themselves the the amount of risks they're going to take and and the um their and how those risks could affect themselves and those around them. But I don't hear you. I don't hear you saying that we need to think about this at a like government level. And that when we think about it at a government level, when we think about it um, from the level of like the social contract, almost. I hear you. I I, I think you're skeptical of that. Well, um, is that a fair characterization? Or? So the, the two points I make is any infectious disease you get is generally contagious from another person or from some kind of environment you're in. And generally, you can be in the control of what environment you're in or who you interact with. So it, it does boil down to your human action, even if the government interferes, because you're still making choices. 
Um, so, I mean, in the end, I, I don't even want to make the like politicized or theoretic or the um, philosophical claim that, you know, your human action is the most important thing. I'm just saying that is inevitable if we're talking about infectious disease. So like if you get if you get like a if you get the cold a cold because and you're sneezing and coughing it's usually because somebody was sneezing and coughing around you and you chose to be in a place you know last year like you went to class because you'd go to class and you knew there was a risk you get a cold and it's not a big deal because whatever so it's just now you have to bake coronavirus into your decision making okay I'm gonna go to this crowded place um, and I know there's a risk just like getting the cold or just like any other infectious disease um, so I'm not really trying to say that that's the more ethical way of looking at it. I'm just saying that is inherently inevitable and you can't even change that. Um, now, when we talk about government involvement, I'm, I'm almost making the efficacy case. I'm not making why it's the government's necessarily bad. I'm just saying it's hard to determine what the correct metrics to make policy is. And human action leads to, I guess in a way, the best allocation of the disease because it's the people who are getting it are usually self-selecting into it or at least self-selecting into the risk of getting it. So it's usually people who are going to be more safe and it's not as blunt because it's not taking away any unnecessary and unnecessary livelihoods. So you're not taking away like the opportunities to go do things for people or to go do their job by just bluntly saying all these things have to be closed. And I, I guess the, the last point on that front I'd make is when you have the government say imposing a lockdown, um, it, it does affect public opinion in a way that's like hard to measure the efficacy of. And I think they make it sound like it's misleadingly good. So when, when they spent a lot of the summer talking about how a lot of numbers were down in certain places because people were being good and like staying in, um, but now we're seeing a rise. So it, it kind of can be misleading. It's like, oh, we have low numbers now with the implication that we're not gonna have low numbers in a month if we let up at all. So that, that that's kind of like, if you're looking at a lot of states, they have these like, red yellow green type phases and you start at the red phase and it's like look all the numbers are low um we'll open up places to 25 percent capacity and then it's like no surprise here the rates went up because you've now increased vectors of transmission so all, all these things aren't really doing anything in the long term they're just they're, 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 they're seemingly effective because it's like oh yeah we were we didn't, our transmission decreased for three weeks and then they have chaos because then they say, well, now transmission's increasing. This isn't good um, because they are only looking at one or two measurements. And I don't think there's any reason to think those are either the right measurements to even look at or that they're necessarily doing anything that's noteworthy because they're just changing the, the time that these infections are happening. Um, so I, it's almost like I, you don't even need to start with the state because it's almost like they're just messing with the time people get cases as opposed to really um, doing anything meaningful other than, you know, you can make the political case other than like taking away people's rights. And I'd probably make all those cases, but in terms of efficacy about the coronavirus, I don't really think it's even having a big picture. If you look at the long-term damage, I don't think it's having a big effect. Now, somebody could take what I just said and they could say, um, where's I going with this? Uh, you know, I, I was going to try to lay out a counter argument for an argument that apparently I'm probably not qualified to make. So that's a dumb thing to do. So I'm not going to I'm not going to lay it out. Um, did, did you have another thought you want to bounce off about that? Talking about, I guess, the state or. Sh I think we can m move on to your another point, actually. OK, I, I mean, we'll be continually talking about the state and its influence throughout the conversation. But OK, so the, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about now are about why certain metrics might be bad or misleading and why a lot of the. I guess ideas we have about the coronavirus might be flawed because we might just be drawing assumptions based on data that might not even be helpful. And um, one of the reasons why I bring this up is because a broad principle that people who are generally small government is that government kind of needs a probable cause to impose a regulation or they need to have some kind of evidence that it will help. Um, but I guess there are a lot of metrics I would point to and say these might be fundamentally flawed and a lot of our information might be fundamentally wrong. Um, so I put a lot of things in the sector, some that we've already touched on, like how we talked about how um, we might we might be able to test and see that 2.2% per, 2 .2 of people had it, but the factor could really be 10 of uh, in terms of the ones we don't know about. So it really could be 22% of people had it and we aren't really sure. Um, and that 
is really important if you're trying to dictate policy, but it's a piece of information we just don't have access to, which really means any policy we make can't effectively understand that factor. So our decision making would be flawed fundamentally. Um, okay, so that's so, so. So we already referenced that one. Um, the thing I'll talk about now is um, this is like a little known study that I think is really significant, and this is why I bust out the paper. So th this was from the New York Times. It was published on August 29th and it was updated in September, and um, and it was titled "Your Coronavirus Test Is Positive, Maybe It Shouldn't Be." And I was completely shocked at this. Well, in a way, I was completely shocked this didn't get much media play, but it's kind of predictable because it doesn't really fit the, the narrative very well. And if and if the media has bad intentions about fear mongering, then this wouldn't be something they want to report. Um, pretty much the idea about this is it breaks down the PCR tests that are used and the PCR tests are like the very common types of tests used in measuring if people test positively or negatively for coronavirus. It's called a PCR test. Um, so essentially what this article is saying is they talked to a few doctors um, and the, a lot of this data, the, it's pretty much questioning the threshold of what makes a positive coronavirus test versus a negative coronavirus test and saying the threshold we are using may be very, very wrong. Um, okay, so here, let me try to find, I should have highlighted the, the thing I was gonna quote. Um, and, and it also does allude to how by not testing asymptomatic people, you're kind of getting skewed data. Okay, let's see. And if I linger too long, I guess I'll, I'll cut, cut them 20 seconds here or there. Okay, so, so here, here's quoting the article. It said, in three sets of testing data that include cycle thresholds compiled by officials in Massachusetts, New York, and Nevada, up to 90% of people testing positive carried barely any virus. On Thursday, the U.S. recorded 45,000 new coronavirus, coronavirus cases. Um, okay. Um, and then, and then, then it goes on to say, if the rates of contagiousness in Massachusetts and New York were applied nationwide, then perhaps only 45,000 of those people may actually need to isolate and submit to contract contact tracing. So it's pretty much saying that when they use their PCR thresholds that are were currently used in those states, they were diagnosing about 90% of the people that tested positive as positive, even if they were very, very, very unlikely to have enough coronavirus in them to actually be able to give coronavirus to another person. And then it goes on to say um, one solution would be to adjust the cycle threshold used now to decide what, when a patient is infected. Most tests, most tests are set the limit at 40, a few at 37. This means that you are positive for the coronavirus if the test process required up to 40 cycles or 37 cycles to detect the virus. Um, but the, a doctor, Dr. Mina, who she gave her credentials earlier in the piece, she is an epidemiologist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She said that a more reasonable cutoff would be 30 to 35. Dr. Bina said he would set the figure at 30 or even less. Those changes would mean the amount of, gen gen the amount of genetic material in a patient sample would have to be 100-fold to 1,000-fold that of the current standard for a return to test positive. Um, and the reason why he says it should be lower is because he's saying that's the point where we should take action on you in terms of isolating you because you're actually contagious. So... And, and it goes on to talk more about the, the, the cutoff rates. So, and it really, this article is, it's, it's really worth looking into. It's, it's a quick read too. It's like five pages. It's called your coronavirus test is positive. Maybe it shouldn't be. Um, so I recommend people Google it if they're listening to this, just because it's kind of mind blowing. But it, it's just the simple idea that we're using a test and it goes without saying that a test could be, you know, have like a 10% false positive rate. But if we're even just thinking about the test itself, the way, like most people don't understand how a test is done in the background. And the way this test is working is it appears making people seem way more likely to be carriers of the disease than they are in practice, which means we may be overstating most of the metrics that we're seeing on TV. So when you hear that there are 40,000 new active cases, well, if the PCR test is 37 to 40 in those places where they're you know, cycling at 40 times to see if there's any coronavirus um, you know, in, in the sample, versus testing at 30 times where you would, you know, have to have a much higher amount of coronavirus in the sample to test positive. 
And that's like a very important difference because maybe if we had decided it was 45 um, cycle tests, maybe we'd think the number would be 22%, right? And that, that, that harkens back to the article we cited before about how maybe way more people have had coronavirus. Um, so I guess the big picture point is we don't really know. And when we talk about cases like how there's 40,000 new cases in a day, well, really the amount of contagious cases might be 4,000, but we're talking about this giant number and it terrifies people and that might be bad. Um, so that's the, that's the first article I wanted to roll out there. If you have any reaction to that before I, I move on a little bit more. So we're gonna look, so I, I, I pulled up an article from the New York Times and it's called your coronavirus test is positive, maybe it shouldn't be. And it came out on August 29th. And um, the, the, the uh, lead line is, the usual diagnostic test may simply be too sensitive and too slow to contain the spread of the virus. And then this whole, article is just kind of about how the PCR tests they're using might be ineffective. So a lot of this cites Dr. Michael Mina, who's an epidemiologist at the Harvard TH uh, Chan School of Public Health. And it goes into kind of his thoughts. And he pretty much says, the yes, no tests aren't good enough. It's the amount of virus that should dictate the infected patient's next step. And then he said, quote, it's really irresponsible, I think, to forgo the recognition that this is a quantitative issue. So just the idea of us having positive and negative active cases is kind of silly. He says, uh, the PCR test amplifies genetic matter from the virus in cycles. The fewer cycles required, the greater the amount of virus or viral load in the sample. The greater the viral load, the more likely the patient is to be contagious. So that means if you do less cycles, but it's positive, that means the viral load is higher, and that means the person's actually contagious. So then he talks about how in, in three sets of testing data from Massachusetts, New York, and Nevada, up to 90% of the people testing positive carried barely any virus. And then he said most tests at the limit at 40 or a few at 30 PCR cycles. Um, and then he goes on to say a more reasonable cutoff would be 30 to 35. And um, he would set the figure at 30 or even less. So that could potentially decrease the amount of cases by a hundredfold or a thousandfold, um, at least the cases that are worth acting on. And then just a couple more points he made that I think are, are worth acknowledging uh, is officials at a New York state lab, um, they have access to their CT values that they processed. So in July, they identified 872 positive tests based on a 40 cycle threshold. But with a cutoff of 35 cycles, only about 43% of those tests, well, ab about 43% of that initial 872 would no longer be positive. And if the threshold was 30 cycles, then 63% 63 of those 872 would also no longer be positive. So this PCR threshold that nobody's talking about could drastically change the amount of active cases from a lab. Um, so yeah, he says in Massachusetts, well, it says in Massachusetts from 85 to 90% of people who tested positive in July with a cycle threshold of 40 would have been ne deemed negative if the threshold were 30 cycles. And then that doctor said, I would say that none of these people should be contract contact traced, not one. So when you hear a lot of stuff on the news about how we should be contact tracing and when people are active, we don't really know anything about what their viral load is or if they're actually contagious or if it really matters. They tested positive or if the test that tested them positive was too, you know, loose with it. And when we get these numbers of cases, we don't really know how many matter or what matters. And that can be misleading when we talk about certain places that are like hot zones, because maybe they just have higher PCR cycles. We don't really know. So it's kind of weird that people are making policy um, recommendations based on it all. It's like a huge variable that's clearly unclear. Uh, so reactions um i would say actually out, out of everything we've talked about so far um i would say you sound i'm, I'm more convinced or i'm convinced mostly by what you said um in, in in that i think um the way people think about positive and negative results um the way the 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 uh average person thinks about it the way the media portrays it um is most certainly um, either invalid or just it's only a half truth. Um, so that that would be definitely something I would want to want to look into uh, more. Um, I actually wanted to 
well, I, I'm going to ask you a question. And if you don't, if you feel it's irrelevant, you can just say, we can just move on. But I'm just kind of curious. Um, earlier, you were talking about how you think the media is um, overblowing. I don't remember the exact phrase you used, but but it, the, the media is kind of um, catastrophizing and, and, and scaring people um, and is, is almost thinking that this is the worst case, that we're living in the worst case scenario. Um, and I just wanted a few more thoughts on um, what you mean by that. Um, I, I don't... Be, be, because I, I think when, when I think about the media or when I trust the media, obviously it depends on the situation. Um, generally, I trust um, I generally trust the the facts they report, quote unquote, but not necessarily I'm not necessarily trusting the in, their interpretation of the facts or their their overall narrative. I'm so I'm just curious what you where you think uh, like the media's what the media's role is in in this entire pandemic situation. Yeah, well, I so I have like the negative view on the average person's uh, t in terms of critically analyzing news. So I think well, so I I think naturally the media has been really bad in terms of saying things that are misleading. Now I think that happens almost every time the media reports on any kind of narrative they say things that are very broad and they report things that reemphasize a narrative, um, whether they're particularly accurate or not. And there are certain things we can see that, that at least to some extent kind of reflect that. Um, one of the articles I don't think I was actually going to discuss, um, yeah, I don't have it pulled up here. Uh, I, I'd seen it earlier today. It was about how initially during the onset of coronavirus around March, um, young people were actually more afraid of getting the virus themselves than a lot of older people. And that, that just shows part is partially partisan um, skewness, right? Because Republican people skew older and they're less likely to be afraid of coronavirus. But it's also just young people have been convinced that coronavirus is dangerous. And a lot of liberal people are saying coronavirus is dangerous. So you're supposed to listen to the people on your team. And they think that they're really at risk. And that's really bad because a lot of young people don't have a lot of good reason to be scared. And it's like, I think you should have your own evaluation and act on your own evaluation. But if you're going to be somewhat quantitative about it, they have like the lowest mortality rates by far. Um, and a lot of them don't have the pre-existing health conditions that older people have. So there's really no reason for like huge percentages of young people to be afraid of coronavirus. And I think as we get further into like lockdowns and just it existing, they're realizing it because they're not hearing about anybody their age dying. And the statistics are becoming more clear. Um, but yeah, I, I would attribute that in some way to the media. And I would say it's given people a false impression. Also, people don't really go to the hospital and see what's going on, because why would you? Um, so it's not like anybody can compare what the media is telling them to their own personal interpretation of events unfolding before them, because you're just holed up in your house watching the news. So to some extent, it's hard to say the validity. Well, what I can tell you is you have talking heads on the news advising people in government on how they should and shouldn't run the country, quote unquote, run the country. Yet they don't talk about things like how PCR tests would greatly skew results and how a lot of the data we're using, it's unclear that they're even equalized in any way that is satisfying. So all the things they're saying are kind of based on a foundation of, I guess, false premises or false assumptions, which is probably bad. Um, that, that's my, that's me hating on the media. Now, I, I think that kind of flows into this and this is a more arguably contentious topic, but I don't have like a contentious take on it. I have a uh, quick follow up if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you can go for it. Um, and I kind of wanted to tie in, um, you know, your favorite human being on the planet, Dr. Fauci. Um, <laughs> and I, 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 this is just kind of a, a broad point, which anyone could really make. Um, but you know, you're, uh, I'm not a medical professional. You're not a medical professional. Um, what, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, um, g given your perception of the whole situation, um, what makes you think that um, without the proper, um, without a background in, in, uh, virology without a background in, in, um, just human health in general. Um, what, what would you say that, what, what would you say, um, 
I'm not questioning the validity of, of, of what you're saying, but I guess what I'm, I'm uh, thinking about is what would you say to the person who is a little suspicious of what you're saying because you're not a, a doctor or a virologist or you, you don't research these things for a living? Um, because that's really, that's often where I fall. Um, in, in, uh, I fall in a, or I'm in a place where um, I don't feel, I don't, I don't know enough <laughs> about um, the, 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 the inner workings of viruses. I, I, I know very little about human health as a whole. Um, so I'm in a difficult position where I can't really evaluate certain claims, certain health claims, um, because I don't have the tools, um, necessary to, to do that. And so, um, that leads me to not always, but generally to accept what, um, the medical professionals are saying. Now, there's some debate here. There, there is some debate, obviously. There is some um, difference of opinion um, across a, a wide variety of, of on, a, on, on a wide variety of issues, but there does seem to be general, um, uh, there does seem to be consensus on quite a few of these things, but I feel like that consensus goes against what you're saying in this whole, what you've been talking about in this whole podcast. Um, so I, I just want a few words from you about, um, you know, uh, what, what you think? What you think your role is in this whole conversation, despite yeah. the fact that neither of us um, really know any the first thing about medicine. <laughs> so I, I think it's actually really a really simple answer, and I think it's a really good answer because it's really simple. And it's that well, okay, okay. I'll give the simple answer, and then I'll give the big elaboration. The simple answer is it's because if you work in the medical field and you work especially in public health, you have the goal of maximizing one or two variables. And we spent the first half of this episode talking about why they are, it seems like policies are trying to maximize certain results that aren't necessarily optimal and why it might be important to look at things more holistically. So a lot of these health professionals say, well, these are things to lower risk. So you should do all of the things to lower risk. So it's like, okay, but then they, 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 they don't talk about marginal effects, right? So it's like, a doctor can straight up tell you if you're interacting with more people, you're putting yourself at a higher risk, but they aren't saying, and, and then generally the conclusions that when they're put in front of Congress is, well, then you should do things that minimize that. So lock everybody down and it's, it maximizes these contingencies. So they, they, they have the interest of like the vague public health, which is we don't want people to get something that we know is an illness. So how do you maximize that? Well, we make those things mostly banned. It's simple. But they aren't looking at things, I guess, in a holistic way. Um, like, because they aren't thinking of, okay, but culturally, will people actually abide by this for six months, right? And and, and they, they aren't really forecasting a lot of different variables. They are looking at it narrowly through this very specific short-term lens um, of, is this, a bad, is this a good thing or a bad thing for people to do when you talk about coronavirus? Um, so, and I'm not, I'm not even disagreeing with most of those things, right? I'm not telling people that they shouldn't, I'm not telling people it's extra safe to go out with your friends without a mask on. I'm not telling you you should do that. I'm just saying that the idea of lockdowns isn't really shown to be effective over a long time horizon. And it seems obvious to just tell people, well, if we know that hanging out in groups of people is bad, why don't we ban it? So a lot of these people who are epidemiologists they, or even people who see patients, they aren't the ones who are supposed to craft policy either. And it kind of goes to why you don't really like economists, because it seems like economists mostly focus on maximizing certain things. And then you would say, well, they're only talking about this, though. Why are they only talking about this variable? Why are they only trying to maximize this with this policy? That seems silly. And that's kind of what it is with the public health experts. It's like they're, they're clearly saying, well, we should do the most extreme thing that is against remotely spreading the virus. Um, but there's no reason to assume that's optimal. So I push back on most of it. Um, yeah, that's okay. So I'm going to jump into a, a couple things about masks. Um, and it's more of just to address, well, this is also kind of a media criticism. And it's not that I'm anti-mask because I'm not at all. It's just to say everything has a trade-off. And it's stupid when people don't recognize trade-offs. And it's annoying. So when we talk about masks, um, the, this is an article I pulled from I pulled from Snopes. Snopes reprinted both these articles I'll talk about. 
because I wanted to go somewhere that was seem that seems credible from like I guess left wing people. That's where I'd rather start. And it's no abstain potential consequences of wearing face masks. So, um, and it just cites a few random things. So like, although we don't have clear evidence that this is happening during the pandemic, a few studies conducted before the outbreak found that people did indeed have worse hand hygiene when wearing a mask. Um, second, to offer any prote protection, masks need to be worn correctly and consistently when in contact with other people. And as most people on the left often get angry when they see people wearing masks incorrectly. And we know that a lot of people just like don't cover their you know mouth and nose at all times so a lot of things that people say have presumptions that are like well we assume that masks will do x y and z um and it's because you assume people will do it to the maximum uh efficacy but i just think that's a silly assumption and i'm not saying masks are bad i'm just saying when people say mask wearing will cause all these things to not happen it's like yeah but you're assuming that people wear them right and much like the lockdown discussion it's like but we know a lot of them aren't going to. So it's like, yeah, they should. But then it's like, I go, I am in Philadelphia where people aren't anti-maskers, but there'll be people who are just kind of lazy about it. And they're like normal people. And then they just like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Pull it below the nose. And that happens all the time. Um, and, then, and then the other point from this article is just a uh, public health body is now recommend that members of the public use masks in places where it's difficult to maintain social distancing. We strongly urge readers to carry on with good hand hygiene and social distancing, not touching their face and using reusable rather than disposable face coverings and safely disposing of them at the end of their useful life. So it's also like, I think that touches on the fact that a lot of people are told to wear masks, but then you have to remember a lot of people are wearing disposable masks like a dozen times and not changing them out. And people are, you know, shoving their masks in their pockets. And it's like, if it's protecting you from incoming things in the air and it's hitting your mask instead of going in you, that's great. But then you put it in your pocket and then it gets all over your hands and then you're touching your face later. So what, what I'm saying is masks can be effective and they are still effective probably despite all those things I said, but people often overestimate things by not talking about these trade-offs. And it seems silly when people act like, masks are a be all end all solution when it's like, yeah, they're effective, but it's like, you know, a bunch of people are going to misuse them because that's just what people do for just about everything. They do most things very suboptimally and that needs to be baked into the cake. Um, so that's just a factor that I think needs to be recognized. Um, should I keep going? No, I, I have something to say. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to, I want to put this in as most, the most charitable way possible. Um, you know, that's, you know, that's a bad way to start a sentence, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> what, what, what I kind of, um, I'm a little, uh, unsure about when you, when you're talking about face masks, um, and this kind of also goes back to, um, uh, just shutting society down, um, for a certain period of time, um, I almost hear you say, or, or it, it, someone could mis misconstrue you into saying that um, just because something is not completely effective, it means that it's not effective at all, or just because we can't do, we can't wear face masks perfectly, or just because we can't institute quarantine perfectly, um, that therefore that means we shouldn't wear masks and we shouldn't. Um, uh, we shouldn't uh, shut things down and, and, and quarantine. Now you did say you're not against masks. Um, so that's, that's important to remember. Um, but what would you say to someone who, who just, uh, who, who thinks you're, um, who, who, who might think that, uh, that, that, that you are, um, yeah, yeah, no, you're, I, you're I, I giving up on, you're giving up on the solutions because they're not perfect or, or you're giving up on possible solutions or possible uh, procedures or policies just because they're not perfect. Yeah. So you, you started that by saying somebody can misconstrue me as arguing that. And it's like, that's fair. They, they, they can misconstrue me. But I, I, I guess what I'm getting at is people will point to lockdowns and they'll point to why doesn't everyone wear masks all the time as if these are remedies, as if they are factors that could pretty much remove the risk to some extent, um, like, or, well, I mean, to remove the risk significantly, or even like be borderline eradication. So people will say, well, if only this state was better about wearing masks, then this wouldn't be a problem. And it's like, well, you do have to remember that it's not like wearing masks all of a sudden, you know, saved blue states, 
because every place is seeing like a quote unquote, like surge in active cases right now. And it's like, and I'm sure people in a lot of blue states, especially blue cities are still having that upswing, even though they're wearing masks. And like one of the reasons is because it might, it does have, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of them because it seems like in general, they're reducing like, I guess the, uh, the, the ability to transmit the disease or to have it transmitted to you. But what I'm also saying is, but don't only talk about masks as if it's the most important thing, because a lot of people who wear them do things that are not hygienic anyways. So it doesn't make a difference for a lot of people. If you rewear disposable masks and put them in your pocket, rub your hand all over the front of them, then the fact that you have a mask over your mouth probably means the same stuff that you're blocking with the mask will eventually get to your face because you're putting it in your pocket, you're putting your hand on it and you're touching your face in the next you know, five minutes once you take the mask off. So I'm not saying like, yeah, you shouldn't wear a mask, but I'm saying if you do it ineffectively, then it's not a be all end all solution. And all you hear on news and on from politicians is wear your mask, you know, as if that's like the most significant thing possible. And it's like, hypothetically, it is arguably, but in practice, I wouldn't say it's um, going to be the difference between, you know, hundreds of thousands of people dying, most likely. Um, so it's just, I guess what I'm saying is people draw really broad conclusions about masks, even though it seems like based on the available evidence, most people use them very poorly. And I'm saying you should still wear them because wearing them poorly is better than not wearing them. But a lot of people wear them poorly. And that needs to be recognized if you're going to talk about policy, because that's the difference between like why when Joe Biden says there should be a national mask mandate, I'm just like, well, there's a lot of times where people aren't at risk anyways that you'd now mandate a mask. And then people do all these things anyways. So it's like, sure, it's better if people wear masks. I would recommend people wear masks, but I'm not going to act like that's the difference between, you know, being successful and not being successful. And I think when it's been looked at internationally, it's been pretty mixed on the efficacy of masks. So it seems like places where people have historically worn masks are people who wear masks very um, effectively because it's ingrained in their culture to do things. Um, you know, more effectively with masks because they've already worn them pre-coronavirus just in terms of health precautions. But it, it makes sense that a lot of Americans would start wearing a mask after never wearing it in public and then not being remotely sanitary with them. So I just think that's a probably a factor that people aren't talking about. I'll just make one quick point and then we can continue down the list. Yeah. Um, I, I'm still, I remain unconvinced I guess about um, how, how should I put this? What you're saying, um, I'm just saying. I, it's I think complex. I, I, think I, I it's I think I disagree. I think I disagree. I think I disagree with um, the way you're interpreting the media's interpretation of masks, um, because again, it. It ultimately boils down to are they or are they not effective? Now, what I heard you said was you should be wearing masks, but I'm not sure. Or I'm, I'm, I'm. It's probably more effective than not wearing a mask, but I'm not. I'm sure saying how it is more it effective is. than not wearing a mask. I, I'm agreeing that I'm agreeing you should wear them, and it's most likely the responsible thing to do on an individual basis. I'd agree with that. I'm just saying there are reasons to be not. I'm not saying skeptical, but I'm. I'm saying that there's reasons to say. But you need to say, you should probably wear it right, and here's all these ways to wear it right, and nobody's clarifying that, and it's just all about the fact that you're wearing it, not the fact that you're doing eight other things that go along with wearing it to not undo the effect. But how does that connect to the earlier point, you, or the uh, point you made near the end, um, where you said the evidence internationally is mixed? Well, I'm saying the evidence is mixed internationally in the sense that not every country where people are now wearing a ton of masks are like suddenly doing better. But if you looked up places like Japan that were never hit super hard, or maybe, or maybe I think South Korea, you could arguably attribute their good use of mask wearing to it, as opposed to our poor use of mask wearing. So you could argue that like, if we didn't wear masks, we'd be worse off. And I, I, and I like, I can't, I, I don't know that universe, but it, that's probably true. But I could imagine the world where all of us didn't wear disposable masks, washed our masks regularly, didn't touch our face after taking our masks off, didn't shove our masks in our pocket, and all these things, and it would probably make it so people were less likely to transmit the disease. So what I'm saying is the fact that we're wearing masks at a high rate doesn't really mean that much because that doesn't make it comparable to these other countries that might have a history of using them better. 
and I'm not saying we shouldn't use them because of this. I'm just saying acting like that's the savior is Joe Biden putting on a mask and telling everybody to wear their mask. I'm just saying that might have a relatively small effect compared to other nations that are doing it because we're not preaching other better etiquettes that might be really important. Okay, I need... um, I'm still a little confused um, because... Okay, let me try... I'll try to say back to you what you said to me and you correct me or jump in when I begin to stray from what you're saying. Okay. Um, Okay, so I hear you saying uh, you're not... You're not advocating people do not wear masks. Um, you, you're not saying, you're not telling the audience members, okay, go, don't wear your mask out in public. Um, you, you did say that uh, wearing a mask is more effective in terms of preventing corona- coronavirus spread than not wearing a mask. Um, but I, I guess that... This is the part where I, you, you lost me a little because um, so you start to talk about you know cultural differences. Some cultures might be more used to wearing masks, and therefore it might be more effective. Um, and then you said um, that the number of we- the the number of uh, people wearing masks um, uh, is or the number of masks out there um, isn't necessarily a good factor to um, judge um, uh, whether. Uh, COVID cases are, will be going down or up or stay the same. Um, yeah, you, you're going to have to, wa- you're going to have to okay. walk me through this a little more. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm really so, confused as to your position on masks because so, I, so, so, I, I, here, here, I feel like here's I'm, what hearing... I'm criticizing. Here, here's what I'm criticizing. I'm criticizing when the media shows a person that's wearing a mask and it's like, look at this person. They're doing the correct thing. They're wearing a mask because that's not where the story ends. The story doesn't end there. Because you can wear a mask and then you're doing everything else wrong to where it pretty, it, I'm not saying it negates fully the effect, but I'm saying it count, it cuts against you a lot. So it's like, yeah, if you're wearing a mask, but it's a disposable mask and it's the 10th time you worn it, then, then that mask could very well be covered in COVID particles because of how much you've been outside exposed to different people, I guess, it, you know, putting their particles into the air. Or, or, or whatnot. So you're wearing this disposable mask. It looks like you're wearing a mask, but you're wearing it for the 10th time. Then you take that mask off with your hand. You, you just rip it off because you're wearing it. It looked like you're doing a good job thing, but you didn't take it off carefully. You took it off with your hand and then you shove it in your pocket. And then later you take it out of your pocket, you throw it down and then you're doing stuff and then you touch your face. And it's like, okay, well, what, 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 what did you do? It's like, well, you wore a mask. Good job. But it's like, but you've also put your hands all over the outside facing part of that mask essentially rubbed it all over your hands and then touched your face incidentally because that's what humans do. So what I'm saying is most people aren't used to wearing their masks all the time because why would they in the United States? So all we do, it seems like from the last, you know, several, like last four months is kind of glorify the fact that say like Joe Biden wears a mask, a mask and like look at these people wearing masks. And it's like, that's good, but that's where the story ends with them. And it's not talking about how ineffectively most people are probably wearing and using theirs. And it's, probably that that, that that could be something that if people paid more attention to might actually be like public knowledge that would be helpful. And it's just like, it's just, so it's just like if you did these other things that put more to it than just wearing the mask, it could put, probably be more effective, but people aren't really thinking of it other than I just wear a mask and I'm safe, right? I'm mostly safe. I have a mask on and it's not the other steps behind it. Um, I'm going to have, to let this one go because I think my, I just in, I'm just interpreting the uh, the media's, I'm I'm, in, I'm interpreting the media and and politicians very differently, or ex- pre- exact opposite to you in terms of of the their way they're portraying masks. Okay. But I don't know if we want to get yeah. bogged down in that, so we can yeah, because, we can move because on to all I point. all I see is look at these people not wearing masks, and then it's like good job this person's wearing a mask, and and none none, none of it is about. The proper use of it it's all and and when i'm in public i see improper use everywhere so it's like sure it's good they're wearing masks i'll give them credit but it's like if nobody's wearing it properly then that's gonna cut against a city or a country right it's gonna hurt their numbers because if they're still doing these things that will spread it by still getting the particles all over them the fact they're wearing a mask it's like yeah that's better than not but we should acknowledge that a bunch of people are doing it badly um, but but then I guess the next article, which was really just the main part I want to take away from the next one, is 
articles do, I mean, masks do really effectively keep you from spreading. You're like, if, if you have coronavirus, the viral load of coronavirus that you're putting out there is reduced a lot by masks. So even if you're doing a bad job of being hygienic for yourself, you're going to be still spraying less out there. Even if you're using, you know, poor, a, if even if your mask is gross, if you cough and you're wearing a mask, it's still safer for everybody else too. So that's the flip side of it. And that's why other people, people always say like, I'm wearing my mask for you and all that stuff. It, it's, it is a good reduction of viral load that you're putting out there for other people to get. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I feel like, and I, I listen to like a pretty wide variety of news, but I'm not listening to local news, right? And maybe, 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 maybe that's what other people hear more of. It seems to me that it's very binary, the mass coverage, which isn't very fruitful. And you, you could disagree with that. And that, that, that just might be the impressions of the different sources we listen to. Um, okay. Are, are we good on mass? Do you want a parting thought before I jump into a couple other things? Um, I'll just say one quick statement. I, I, I just, um, I think the media is emphasizing masks due to their effectiveness. I don't think, um, I don't hear people in the media um, uh, saying, you know, um, masks are, I, I don't hear them, um, I guess, in the way that you're hearing them. I, I, I don't think they are um, uh, necessarily ignoring details or, um, or, or looking at um, masks um, as, uh, you know, as the only thing related to, um, saving us from the coronavirus. I, I just, I don't see that. Um, that's, that you can, that can just be a disagreement between us. Yeah. I think there's a little bit more nuance there that I think I would, might make on my side and there's probably plenty you would make on your side, but I, I, I think a little bit is just perceptions of, 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 of news coverage. Um, okay. The last two things I'll talk about is a time article that came out in September. I think it's pretty relevant when we're talking about um, the newer increases in cases, because they, so if, if you look up the, this time article, younger Americans are eclipsing older age groups and COVID-19 case counts, you'll find this article and there's a really pretty chart that's right at the beginning of the article that's titled monthly share of COVID-19 cases by age. And it's really fascinating because it gives you the January through April column and then it shows month by month, May, June, July, and August afterwards. And you can see that the amount of people who are in the older age ranges, which I would, I guess, loosely classify as 70 and up, um, the amount of people who have coronavirus in those groups have been decreasing since January through April significantly. And those are the people who are were most at risk for the disease. Now, a lot of people would probably... I mean, I think the edgy retort somebody would make in their head if they were listening to me say that would be, well, yeah, because they all died. And I don't think that's actually that true. Um, but I, I guess I would say, if you look at this type of chart and you have this type of breakdown of ages, even if cases increase, then I don't see the big deal of it because the people who are most susceptible aren't getting it. So if you look at like all the uh, top three age brackets, which is um, 60 plus, in August, less than 20% of the coronavirus cases were for people age 60 plus. But back in January, it was about, it looks like probably somewhere in like the 28% range, 27% range. Um, and then when you look even more, it looks like only about 30% or so of people who were under 40 made up coronavirus cases. But now that's about half the coronavirus cases are people under 40. And people who are under 40 have like vastly lower mortality rates with coronavirus. So even though we're probably seeing these increases of cases um, as we reopen, a lot of these increases are attributed to people who aren't at risk getting it, at least relative to older groups that are most at risk. So that's why when I hear these numbers, I kind of like roll my eyes because I, I turn on NPR and then they talk about the huge uptick in cases. But then it's like if you compare it to a few months ago, the groups of people who are getting it more or who are a larger share of the case pool are like much safer. Right. So the people who are most like likely to not really be hit by the disease are the people who are making up a larger percent of the cases. So 
it's not as big of a deal. It's the people who, if they get it, they likely won't have serious, um, you know, have a serious issue and they're developing some sort of at least short term immunity to it, which isn't really a bad thing. Um, especially when you look at the group that's uh, the group that's 30 and younger, I, their, their mortality rate is very, very, very low. And for people who are under 20, their risk of dying from coronavirus is less than people dying from the flu in their age range. So it's, it's really not a huge health risk for them, at least in the short term. Uh, do, you, do you have thoughts on that one before I jump into the last one I had in front of me? I think it just goes back to um, how we're evaluating um, how we're evaluating the danger of coronavirus, um, because one could say um, we don't know. For example, as you said, I think in an earlier part of the podcast, we don't know the long term effects of coronavirus. Um, and I'm, again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not saying this is for, this is, um, this is a fact. I'm just speculating. Um, what if, um, young people or healthy people, they, they don't get sick with it, like, um, or very, the, 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 their symptoms aren't that bad or, or their case isn't that bad, but it, it has some impact on them when they're, you know, when they turn 60 or 70, it has some long-term effect that might not be of noticed right away um so so i just i just you know i wanted to throw that out there we we, we need to um I, I think it can be easy to uh make lazy arguments um and and either and either say you know use lazy arguments to say that it's extremely dangerous and lazy arguments to say that it's not dangerous um and th there's nuance here and, and we, we need to be careful um, in the arguments we make um, when we're talking about um, uh, the, the when we're talking about coronavirus and the impact that it has on our lives. Yeah, I so I actually like they brought up that point because I I did I was going to bring this up at the end um, we, we, at the podcast we didn't end up getting to it one way or another, but I, I think the um, the lazy argument in favor of lockdowns is probably um, and, and in favor of extreme lockdowns is probably the most the argument I'm most sympathetic to because it pretty much is lazy because it says we don't know things. Therefore we should be as extremely conservative as possible. Um, and this is kind of, to some extent, this was uh, originally, I think this was not, not Nazim Nicholas Taleb's ar argument, which, it, you know, I've referenced him before because he wrote like the black swan and he is like a statistician. And he pretty much says, if there are huge risks that we aren't aware of, of coronavirus, coronavirus transmits very highly Therefore, all these risks would be like huge tail risks, because if anybody gets it, it can transmit rapidly. And if it's way worse than we expected, we're screwed because it, it you know, it can grow in on itself like everybody can get it. So unless we cut it off like how the countries that have zero cases do, then we're we should really be scared. And I think that's like I think that's one of the best cases for any kind of lockdown is we're really, really, really concerned about long term effects that we can't know. So we will take the utmost precautions. And like, I think if you're going to, if you're going to weight these long terms outside risk very heavily, then I think that's a valid point. I just don't think most people do. And I don't see many evidence. I don't see much evidence to lean in that direction. Um, because a lot of things that have come out that, that, that were kind of flashes in the news was about like how people's lung scans looked after they had coronavirus. And a lot of that stuff was kind of, um, evened out in the months following it to where a lot of light was shed on that to where that might not be a, le a legitimate concern. And, and it's also kind of interesting because that's the same argument that anti-vaxxers make. So if a vaccine does come out for coronavirus and then people show that it is effective in keeping people from getting coronavirus, the anti-vaxxers, the first thing out of their mouth is going to be, well, you haven't tested this vaccine on people for, in the long term and we don't know the long term side effects of it. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same decision that people make when they get vaccines, if they're concerned about long-term side effects, it's, do you want to, um, super, you know, hedge this way about there being a potential risk of long-term effects that I can't know about for the time being. So I'll avoid it at all, all costs, or will I accept that that risk is very unlikely 
and then act accordingly. Um, I lean on the act accordingly side because I just don't see the, the evidence that there are long-term risks we should be scared about. Now, if there does end up being one, that's really bad, but we're already kind of past, I think, the point of no return in that considering how many people have been exposed. Um, if we were going to do something, we should have locked down in like December, the first time anybody had ever heard of coronavirus um, and then been very incredibly strict about all sorts of things and then been um, almost, I guess, what's the word about it? Um, almost m m mil military styled, I think. I, I think that's like the argument I'm most sympathetic to. That's not my stance. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I, so the, the idea that um, we need to be cautious or we need to be conservative or we need to be we need to err um on the side of caution wait, wait, uh, as the cliche goes you know better safe than sorry um I, I think that is really that is the best way to handle um policy or uh, handle um uh, public health policies um i think that's a trap i think you just fell into a trap and that's I, I don't say that lightly. And like that has been the excuse for a lot of very bad policies in the United States history about a lot of things um, in terms of like why we don't have any privacy from the government um, is, oh, that there is a risk that something bad could happen in terms of foreign affairs. Therefore, the government can do X, Y and Z. And I, I, I would say that it's it, it's a new disease. So sure, really anything is possible until we fully understand it. But saying we should err on the side of caution, I mean, if we were truly to err on the side of caution, that does mean military style lockdowns because we don't want anybody to get this no matter what, unless they absolutely already have gotten it. And then we quarantine them from their families. That's how you minimize the spread. And the government could do that if they want. If they wanted to and it got public support, they could do that. I just don't see why you would err there. That's like it's really extreme to err on the side of caution. It's not something to say lightly. Well, no, I think. Uh, I, I need to be well. Let me need to further my point so we're on the same page. Um, I, I I think what I said means something slightly different for, to you than what I I was trying to say or what I was meaning to say. Um, <clears throat> the and I don't think I fell into a trap in in the sense that um, to it, it's only a trap in the sense that um, you can cite. Um, uh, destructive people. You can cite, you know, supposedly bad people in history um, who uh, said something about the public good, and therefore we have to do X. Um, but that doesn't necessarily invalidate the idea of doing something for the public good, if that good um, is actually good, or if that good is is a legitimate um, goal to um, desire. Um, and I, I, I don't, I don't. Um, it doesn't bother me to say that because, um, as I said, when it comes to to health, um, health is pr probably the most or one of the most, if not the most important things in our lives. Um, and so I, I think we do need to come together <laughs> as a community um, in, 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 in cases like this, um, I think it, it worries me somewhat, um, and I'm not saying you are doing this, um, but it worries me somewhat, the people out there um, who are <clears throat> vastly um, underestimating um, the potential negative effects of coronavirus. Um, I'm, I'm not saying we go into panic mode. I'm not saying it's the end of the world. Um, I, I'm not even saying that anything the government does will be 100% effective. Um, but I, I don't think we should play <clears throat> games with the, the, the public's health. Um, and, and I think we, we need to, we do need to be careful. We do need to tread carefully. We do need to think um, long and hard on... Um, on the the nature of the coronavirus and and um, the the possibilities, um, just just because, <clears throat> like I said, I mean the um, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Um, 
So I, I just want to make clear, again, I'm not a doctor, but I, I do think this is a serious concern. Um, I can have disagreements. I, I can have disagreements with this policy or that policy, or I can be annoyed that um, researchers were a bit inconsistent in the beginning or, or uncertain about certain things. Um, you know, I, I don't claim that I don't claim perfect knowledge and, and I don't claim that the government has perfect knowledge or that the medical professionals have perfect knowledge. Um, but I, I do think um, I, I am worried. I'm more worried about underestimating the coronavirus than overestimating the coronavirus. Um, if I said, if I think I said that right, um, I, I'm more worried about taking it, not taking it seriously than I am about taking it too seriously. Um, because I think taking it not serious, I think, uh, the, the, um, I think if we don't take it seriously, the, the cost, the human cost will be so great. Um, and I, I think the, um, it, if we take it too seriously, as some people would, would say, they, they think we're, this, we're doing as a society, um, I'm more content with those trade-offs than I am with other kinds of uh, the, the, the trade-off of not taking it seriously at all. Okay. I'm glad you said that because I think that's the whole reason why we're doing that episode is I think what you just said is conventional wisdom. And I think what I'm laying out is I was trying to systematically poke the holes in that. So I want to revisit a couple points. Um, so, and, and I, I'm not going to try to be too argumentative about it because if I was, there's a few things I would, I'd probably push back on you more um, on in terms of actual policy. But okay, so the, the first thing I would say is everything that is in the name of prioritizing limiting coronavirus um, cases and coronavirus deaths ends up having some sort of human cost, but it might not be direct in an obvious way, which is why we see all these all these people who are depressed and who are killing themselves. All those people are human lives and they're dead now. And if we didn't have a, well, I'm not saying it's government's response, but I'm saying the government response that has been very blunt and was initially very blunt in March and has created uncertainty for what the government will do in the future, which has only you know further made economics and running businesses more confusing. All of that proliferates the, uh, you know, depression that anybody who's on the margin in terms of making money um, has. And it's also, I mean, talking about finance just personally is one thing, and that's not the only thing that's causing it. It's it's social isolation, where people just aren't seeing friends, coworkers, or going to class, and they just didn't have anybody in their life in person. Um, and that took a huge toll, and that was the trade-off, one of the many trade-offs of lockdown policies, right? And, and, and people taking coronavirus very seriously because of what the media told them to. And I know people in a lot of red states didn't have those same losses because they weren't taken as seriously, but there are people who are very young and healthy, like like me, that are taking it so seriously that they're jeopardizing their mental health. And they probably are more at risk from their mental health now than they ever were from coronavirus as far as we understand. And I think that is really important to consider because if somebody kills themselves, then they're dead. And, but if somebody gets coronavirus and is 20, then the odds of them dying is infinitesimal. And we, there have been novel, there have been coronaviruses in the past. There have been things that are very similar to the coronavirus in the past. And I would not want to say that I fully understand the coronavirus, but most diseases that are like coronavirus, unless they hospitalize you and do damage to your body in significant noticeable ways, aren't gonna have long-term petering out consequences. So if you get hospitalized, probably did damage to your body, and that could very easily, you know, have long-term impacts. But a lot of young people just are not susceptible to coronavirus in the way elderly people are. And they really are overestimating their risk a lot of the time, even though they're being the ones who are the increase in a lot of these cases. It's still a lot of people, who, especially who are left-leaning, are living in fear, and it's drastically hurting their quality of life. And I'm not just talking 20-year-olds, pretty much anybody under 40 is um, not really at risk to be hospitalized or die from it. So it's like, that's, you can't just ignore that consideration. That's like a dramatic impact now. 
So it's like, I don't, when people talk about lockdown policy, it's like, it's not just, I can't go to sit down at a fast food place. It's like people are socially isolated and they aren't necessarily people who can psychologically handle that. Um, and that's just a lot of personality traits. And you could probably argue that's about culture and that's fine, but it's the reality we live in. Um, and then that, and that, that, that's to state that the policy would even work because then the people who you disagree with that underestimate it would then go and defy the regulation and then when they defy the regulation, it kind of undermines the work that you intended to do. So it's a double whammy. It's like the people you disagree with end up not up, not, not not following along, so it doesn't work. And the people you do agree with overestimate the risk and then potentially have more personal issues in the moment because they're actually more at risk to mental health ailments. Um, and I don't think that can be just hand waved. That, that's got to be reconciled. Um, two points. So then I get, I don't know if, did you have one more point after this or I don't know how long? Yeah, there, there was one other skepticism on, I guess, coronavirus stats I wanted to lay out there. That's important. All right. Um, I'll just say two things really quickly. Um, one, um, I have not, I mean, not in the last couple of weeks, uh, I have not seen these articles in the last couple of weeks, but it wasn't that long ago that I was seeing articles that said that, um, not only were, uh, cases going up among young people so were hospitalizations um now but, 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 well, is it true what i was saying can both be true they can both be true is it true they can both be true i know be, so be, be, be. yeah yeah so, so, so what i'm saying is young people can go out there and they could underestimate it and those are the people who will never believe that coronavirus is that serious to them but the thing is that's different than the people who are actually at super low risk because some people will obviously be hospitalized it's a really low percentage but some will be you still have a risk, right? It's just really low. So if more are going out there and getting it, then they still have a risk, but it's really, really low. Just like when I get in a car, there's a really, really low risk, but there's still a risk that I'll get hurt. So, and especially compared to other people in older age groups. But what I'm saying is now we've drastically, for the people who are overcompensating, now they're in more danger if you do lockdowns, because then they're afraid that they're going to go out there and die, even though their risk is supremely low compared to most human beings on the planet. And then they're taking all these social costs that are me mentally, you know, detractive. And even people who are very mentally healthy have probably posted things on their social media about being more depressed because they don't see their friends. Like that's affected pretty much everybody, no matter what. And that's not good. I, I, that's the point I'm trying to get across. But I, I, I know the point you're making. Like it is increasing, but it's also like, OK, but if you put more fear in them, then they're going to be more afraid to interact at all and they're going to be more depressed. So it's like a double-handed sword, double-edged sword, and the risk of them getting like really sick is like really low. Let me let me further my point though. Um, so yes, um, two two things are true. Um, in the sense that that uh, someone my age, I'm 21, and you're I think 23, 24. Um, our age, or even a, a little older than than uh and than we are, um, that age group, um is it is less you are less likely to um, get it or to, for it to adversely affect you. This is true. Um, but um, it as you say, there is still a risk involved. and um, even for young people, the, the risk the, the, the risks e even young people without pre-existing conditions, mind you. So so with some of these increase in cases or increase in hospital hospitalizations among young people, it's not just oh you know increase of people with asthma um, that that are getting it. It's it's people without young people without pre-existing conditions who are uh, young people without pre-existing conditions who are uh, they are they are now more and more likely to be hospitalized. It might be smaller than than um, some. People, my grandfather's age, my grandfather's 85, he has, statistically speaking, he would be more likely to be hospitalized due to coronavirus than I would. Um, but, you know, we, we both agree that there's still a risk involved. Um, and, and the question, the, the question, though, is, I suppose, um, what risks are you willing to accept or what risks are you willing to deal with and what risks are you going to mitigate um, as much as possible? Um, now, I, I need to say something really quickly um, about the whole mental health thing, um, because I don't want to be misconstrued. Um, the, 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 the mental health effects 
of um of 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 uh, stay, of staying at at your at home most of the time and not being able to go out very often, not being able to socialize as much. Um, those are real, um, and I don't want to minimize them. I'm not trying to hand wave them or downplay them. Um, it, it 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 is it is a difficult time for everyone at some level. Um, if not, you know, uh, health wise, then um, then mentally, it is a difficult time for everyone mentally. Um, but I am not yet convinced. Um, I, I'm not yet convinced that um, due to um, the, the 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 mental health difficulties on while um, the mental health difficulties. Let me start over. I'm not convinced yet due to the ment uh, due to the uh, mental health difficulties um, in quarantine uh, while people are in quarantine while people are quarantine quarantining themselves. Um, I'm not convinced that that therefore means that um, quarantine is bad or that we shouldn't be quarantining or that um, and, and that that's not me saying like I'm I'm hand waving those deaths, um, but that that is me saying. Um, it, it depends on, um, again, I, I guess I think I might have said this at the be very beginning of the podcast, but it really depends on, on how, um, what, what we're willing to accept, I guess, in other words, what, what are we willing, um, what human cost is too much and what human cost is just a part of life, I guess is a good way of phrasing it. Um, and, and and I don't know, but the mental health thing. I mean, that's a. I could do a whole podcast by myself on that very topic. I mean, it's just a. It, it's a. It's a mountain. The, the the mental health stuff. We don't have a good mental health system. Period in this country. Um, so it's not surprising to me that that a a a um, that people's mental health is deteriorating in quarantine when people's mental health um it isn't very good to begin with in in this day and age, um, and we don't deal with it effectively anyway um and so it, it seems to me unfair to blame uh, uh government uh or, or or countries locking down or for, to, to, it, it seems unreasonable to say um well i'm suspicious of lockdown or i don't think lockdowns are working or i don't think lockdowns i don't think we should do a lockdown because there's been an increase in suicides um but again that's not me saying that um I want an increase in suicide. That's not me saying that that's a good thing. Um, but we have to think, we have to be very careful here and we have to um, d decide what, hu again, to reiterate my point, we have to decide or figure out what human cost is just a part of life and what human cost I, is I have too a question. much. How, how can that be decided? And I ask that meaning, you know that if we decided something and then enacted a policy, that a bunch of people who just don't agree with it won't follow along. And that's kind of what happened in the last five months. So a bunch of people do actively decide through their actions what they're willing to take on and what they're not. So I guess what I'm saying is, haven't we already decided that? In, a, in essence, every time a person doesn't care, they have decided. Because because I just don't understand how we even get to the, an answer to your question, because I just don't think, I, I don't think that's how it works. I would say I would in in response I would say that um, it it uh, at the macro at the micro level I guess in in other words um, you're right in the sense that each of us are making these calculations by uh, by ourselves um, we might be thinking about other people um, but but we're coming up we're coming with to the consensus to do X Y or Z I, I came to the consensus that I'm going to wear a mask out in public. Um, I'm sure you did as well. Um, but I am thinking about, um, the, what we need to decide. And again, this is a, a big buzzword, but what we decide as a community, what yeah, we, we I, need to, we need to come together. It, this, this is the thing. Well, I'm this, saying that just doesn't happen. I, it, it does. And you come together and people vote and then you get a president and then somebody says, okay, in this state, we in this, our, our city locks down for two weeks. And then, and then the, all the, all that the data shows on people's anonymized data is then all the people skip town and they go to the beaches to two cities over because they, because they don't agree. 
and there there is no collective decision. It's just not something that can happen. So I just I just don't I just don't think even in practice what you're saying is possible. And I, that's my big critique of lockdowns. I'm just saying like in the United States they just can't work because people collectively protest them by just going and ignoring them. And it's not like an active like oh we got in a circle and we held signs. It's like no they just stop abiding by it and they just go and hang out at their friend's house with ten people because they decide that. So I, I just don't understand how in practice that can even, it's even humanly possible. And unless you imposed your mindset on everybody, which we know culturally can't happen in the United States because everybody just kind of doesn't want to take collective action. They kind of just stop following the rules at some point. So I'm saying they, they can't But we're assuming what you're, or you appear to be assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would want to know that the, the majority, I, I would want to know statistics on this. Um, are most people following the rules? Like, or are, are, are most people not following the rules? Is it 50-50? That, well, that, is a, that would be important to answer before really I, we could get further on this question. Okay. Um, I mean, because it, I it seems, it's under my, I'm under the impression, I'm under the impression that um, most people are following the rules most of the time. That doesn't mean there aren't people who aren't following the rules. That they are. There were always people who aren't fo- who won't follow rules. But I'm under the I, I'm under the impression, um, partly anecdotal, partly just from re- reading stuff online and talking to people. Um, most people um, are following these rules most of the time, and, and so therefore that is most of us coming together as a community and saying, okay, we we think these uh, w- we think this is a good way to um, live our lives under the circumstances. Um, so uh, that that's really what that's really all I'm saying. And, and and fair enough. And I'm sure we'll dig into a lot of where we depart. I guess probably another time because we're already uh, probably nearing on like two hours or something like that into talking about my esoteric criticisms of data analysis in terms of policy making, which is is I guess relatively esoteric. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about was a Reason Magazine article that was titled "What's the Herd Immunity Threshold for the COVID-19 Coronavirus?" and one of the things that this article pretty much talks about is it, it's somewhat, it's somewhat, uh, uh, what, what's the thing that those elitist uh, people always say on policy shows? They, they're always like, I know this is kind of wonky. It's always really annoying because it's like, oh, yeah, you're, you're so smart and cool. You care about the smart and cool things. Um, but this is kind of wonky, I guess, to some extent. So when you're talking about transmission rates of a virus, the variable they use is called R0. And the R not in question for coronavirus COVID-19 is kind of in question. Um, so depending on the researchers you talk to, they estimate it at different levels. And one of the reasons why I like this reason article is it has a table in it that says approximate herd immunity thresholds for infection elimination. And what the article is all about is it's all about the correlation between how high R, R not is and how high herd immunity needs to be to eradicate a disease. Um, and one of the reasons why this is so interesting is because in this table, it lays out a bunch of diseases like mumps, polio, rubella, smallpox, and then uh, H1N1. And it says what their R0 was. And then it shows the herd immunity threshold that's commonly thought of for being the herd immunity needed for that disease to essentially go away. So how many people need to have immunity based on the transmission rate? And they, they come, kind of come to the conclusion because the R0 is undefined. Now, we really don't know what kind of herd immunity we'd need for coronavirus to go away. It could be anywhere between 10% of people having a lot of immunity to 70%. And this is all because we don't really truly understand the r not of coronavirus. Um, and part of the reason I just bring this up is because when we talk about, I guess, central plans and containment, it's one of those things that we don't know the variability of how many people actually need to be, say, vaccinated against this because we don't really understand the true are not. And a lot of that comes back to how we we're talking about PCR testing and what actually should count as a positive test and who's actually positive and who's actually negative. And if we can't even understand basic things like who should really be considered a case and who shouldn't, how could we even begin to understand how transmissible the disease is and then what the real goal should be, which is immunity from the disease. So it's kind of hard to have a game plan if like, I think we've gone through several articles, but we're talking about so many variables that are undefined now, when we talk about aiming a policy towards a goal, it's like so tough to do. Um, and yeah, so I, I just think that's important to, I guess, recognize what, what, whether you're on the side of big government or not, big government policies, if they estimate certain variables and are wrong, 
then their policy could be really, really backwards and could indirectly harm a lot of people and not have much positive impact. And then, uh, vi and then vice versa. And that's, that's, a that's the wrap on my, uh, statistical skepticism from random articles I've picked up over the last eight months. So do, do you want to chime in on a uh, herd immunity are not transmissibility statistics? Hmm. It's hard to know what path to go or what uh, final thoughts I should really say. Um, I mean, I guess this is kind of what comes to my mind. Um, or, 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 Maybe I could put it more in the form of a question. Um, so some people, are, well, I don't know. Let's put it like this. The president um, likes to compare uh, coronavirus to flu. Um, but one key difference between coronavirus and the flu is we've had, the, the flu has been around far, far longer than the coronavirus, or and we have far more experience with the flu um, so, um, wouldn't you say, um, or isn't it reasonable at some level to, um, given, to, to tread carefully, um, so to speak, given the fact that we don't know so much about the coronavirus? Yeah, so everything I'm saying, the whole, I, okay, so... I, I, I think, okay, I, th I think things are clicking more in terms of how this conversation has gone in ways that were unexpected for me, because I, I should be, I, I should be framing it. Well, I mean, I should have understood my framing better going in. So I agree with you. I'm saying we should tread carefully, because we don't really understand it. Um, but part of why I framed a whole conversation around this is because, to me, the dangers of policies going wrong that people try to implement seems very, very, very dangerous. And the only danger of coronavirus being deadlier than we expect is really if there's a long-term effect that we have not captured yet and don't understand and won't for a decade. Um, to me, that's the biggest concern. But I, I would, I'm, I'm appeased by seeing how low uh, so, some, some stats are in terms of like how much treatment's improved over the last several months and seeing how fewer people, I guess, are dying Per, per, per rate of, um, you know, the amount of cases and hospitalizations to where I don't think it's unfair for individuals to make their own decisions and say, eh, it's not too bad for me. Um, now, comparing it to the flu, like you, you can, you, the, any comparison you make it to is bad for any reason. But like, I like comparing it depending on the variable you're talking about, right? So if we're talking about risk on the individual level, I think you should compare it to driving in a car. If I never get in a car, I won't get in a fatal car accident unless the car goes off the, you know, the, the street and hits me. Or if I live in my house my whole life, the odds of a car coming in and killing me in a car accident is very low if I never leave my home. But I will usually take on a small amount of risk to go drive um, or, or be driven somewhere. But then people can say, well, that, that's a terrible comparison, right? Because dying in a car accident is not transmissible to other people. So it... So you can compare it to things like the flu in narrow ways where it's probably accurate. Like if you talk about mortality for young people, it's pretty comparable to the flu, but we don't know about long-term effects. So obviously like we can't assume there's none, but we probably shouldn't assume it's like obscenely bad, especially if you're mostly asymptomatic. Um, so I don't mind the comparison as much as other people do. Um, because I think it's accurate in some dimensions and not in some, just like I feel the same way about car accidents. I feel like you should compare it to car accidents when I'm talking about if I want to go to the movies or not um, for, for me as an individual, but you probably shouldn't talk about it if you're talking about transmissibility. Okay. Does it, did that answer it? Um, maybe one quick follow up. Yeah. Go so, um, all right. Are you suggesting then that um, the, I guess I just want a quick point of clarification about whether um, coronavirus, the risk of coronavirus is similar to um, the risk of driving a car or not. I just need to be, yeah, I need I'm that sure point driven home. I'm pretty sure if you're under 40, the risk of like, in terms of mortality for coronavirus is similar to being in a car for your whole life. Like in, in terms of driving a car your whole life. 
um, it's it's something it's something similar in terms of how minute Dyn in either way is. Um, if you're if you don't have pre-existing things that push you at risk, like if you're not obese and you don't have like certain types of heart issues that would make breathing difficult, and and so forth. Yeah, it's it's pretty comparable. That that's why I think there is a true issue of overstating the risk of it to people who have really no large um, threat as far as we understand, unless there is a good reason to suspect that there are long-term effects, which up to this point there, I, I don't believe there is any. I mean, I mean, a holdout skepticism is a possibility, but there, there's not a lot of evidence that points in that direction. Um, and is the, but, but, but is the fact that um, potentially at least um, COVID affects it can affect more than one person. Um, get, so given the spread, though, does that alter whether we can con compare it to the risk of driving a car? Well, that, well that, that, so that's what I just said. I said it's an apt comparison in terms of things like mortality on the individual level, and it's not an apt comparison in terms of transmissibility, right? That's why I don't mind the flu comparison, because the flu comparison is an apt comparison about some elements, like mortality rates for young people, it's neither of them are very deadly. And then it's a bad comparison when it comes to how transmissible it is and, you know, certain, certain other elements. So I, I, I don't really get boggled up in bad comparisons if you're using them in, you know, narrow ways. So I, I don't, I don't get mad at Trump for comparing it to the flu that, that much. I just, I just don't think it really matters. Um, but what would you say to someone who says that, um, because of the um, ability of coronavirus to spread, um, perhaps we should treat the risk differently than the, than the way we treat driving a car, the risk yeah, of driving yeah. a car. Well, yeah, so, 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 so I wouldn't say those should be the same thing, but I would also kind of say, and this, is what, this is what we said about, I guess when you brought up personal responsibility and I kind of said infectious disease always kind of comes down to what you do. So it's like, sure, if everybody actively has a case of coronavirus, if everybody but you, everybody in the United States but you had an active case of coronavirus, then if you go to the store, like, yeah, you're probably going to get it. And that's, you didn't really have a choice. Um, but if you're a person, but even in that scenario, if you stayed inside and literally didn't leave your house, nobody would be there to give it to you. Now we live in a world that is much less intense than the world I just described, where a small amount of people are likely active carriers. Um, and nobody is really compelled to leave their house. You can argue they're compelled to, if, um, the only job offer opportunities they have involve physically going somewhere and they really need the money. And you can argue they should for food to pick up food and they have nobody to pick up food for them. Like that, that, that is an argument you can make, but in general, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a quick grocery store shop, grocery store shopper. I take all the precautions I'm in and out of there in like 10 or 15 minutes. Cause I know exactly what I'm going to buy. And I'm a whiz through the self checkout line. Um, so what I'm saying is you can lower your own exposure a lot to the point where it's like, well, do I worry much about 20 year olds when a 20 year old has to interact with an 80 year old to give the 80 year old coronavirus? And it's like, well, no, I would advise the 80 year olds not to interact with 20 year olds that might have it. And I, I think that's a very simple answer. Um, okay, so we, we covered a lot in this one. Um, oh, and the, the thing I was starting to get at was I spent the episodes p painting the idea of skepticism and my argument is because of skepticism, you can't do big policies because you can't really understand the opportunity cost, right? So whenever you make a policy, there's opportunity cost. And if we don't really know the danger, then you're forcing all these opportunity costs, like by doing these blunt policies on everybody, and you don't really understand what we're even working towards. That, that That's my concern. But it is reasonable for, for somebody who is not oriented in my thinking to go, oh, yes, skepticism means we must ensure that this is minimized until we understand what's going on. And that is the argument for 18 month lockdown. And that's why I'm kind of sympathetic to that argument if lockdowns work better. Um, but I just don't think they're practical and in practice they work. So that's kind of the thought I was getting at there. And that's why a lot of your criticisms made sense because the whole upset I'm talking about skepticism and you're like, yes, shouldn't we err on the side of government tells you you can't do all these things that could be a risk for some people. And I'm sitting here saying, no, that's why skepticism means the government shouldn't stick their hand in it. And it actually makes a lot of sense that we came to opposite conclusions based on the same evidence, if that's kind of what's happening, um, because those are our priors. So that kind of makes sense. And um, so I'm not as upset about that, 
once I kind of that clicked for me. So, but I, I do think that's noteworthy to err on here because a lot of people that listen are probably going to be people who identify more with one of us because we're kind of partisan and most people are kind of partisan. Um, so as I'm saying things, it'd be very easy for somebody who disagrees with me on the conclusion to agree with what I'm saying and then draw the opposite conclusion. Um, so I just thought that was worth worthy of note. Um, since I spent the episode pontificating my beliefs and only giving you moments to flash your uh, stance, if you want to say a minute and a half before I do these shout outs to how they can listen to us and hear more from us, feel free. Um, I know you can't give an exhaustive breakdown of your 20 point policy plan that I know you printed out and you've been working on for the last three months, um, but I will give you enough time to give a minor uh, 90 second. I, I will mute Trump's mic and let you talk for 90 seconds. And uh, you, you can go ahead and say your piece and I won't be an asshole. Um, oh, I'm not supposed to curse on this show. Um, we would try not to do that. That's my bad. I'll try not to be a jerk about it. And then um, and then we'll sign off. Um, okay, so there's just kind of like two meta points that I want to make. And one is a point about like the country like broadly. And then one is a point like about this conversation we're having. So just a quick point about like um, the country as a whole amid the pandemic. Um, I'm a little, um, concerned. I think, I think that's the right word. I'm a little concerned about how partisan, how political, uh, coronavirus has become. Um, and I'm, I, I don't want to get, I'm not trying to veer into the territory of like, um, uh, certain, what certain liberals, certain liberals like bemoaning that the, the like oh we used to care about the truth and now we don't care about the truth anymore i'm not trying to say that <laughs> i'm not making a cheap point like that um but it, it it does worry me that it does seem to me that one's view of coronavirus has far more to do with politics than it actually does with the facts on the ground um and i i think that is that is particularly worrying given the potential human cost either of shutting down or not shutting down. Um, and so the, the, then the meta point about this conversation, um, I guess I, I want to ex explain a little bit about my thought process. I, I explained a little at the beginning, but explain a, just a little more just for further context, and then you can wrap up. Um, in in my thought process, I was trying to keep my my own opinions to a minimum, um, but but there were there were a couple times when I thought um, that to, in order to play the devil's advocate properly, I should give like actual examples of maybe my thought process or just the thought process of the average person or the thought process that the mainstream media um, is putting forth. Um, so I, I hope that didn't, I hope that didn't derail the conversation too much, but, but it seemed, uh, it, it seemed the best way to, um, for me at least to understand where you're coming from. Um, I hope it was, I, I hope, uh, I did my job in the sense that anyone listening to this, um, besides you and I uh, was also able to understand your perspective through some of my questions and my um, criticisms and whatnot. Um, like I said, uh, we'll probably be doing a follow-up episode. Um, give me one moment. Sorry, that was Ted talking to someone. Um, oh yeah, okay. I think I remember what I was gonna say. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll wait a second, and then we'll. I'm gonna have to do a lot of editing, but anyway. Um, we'll probably do a follow up episode um, in the near future. 
um, in which I um, am the one pontificating <laughs> and I'm the one um, laying out my case uh, in a far uh, in a far better way than I, I did during this um, episode. Um, and then Matt will be Matt will be the devil's advocate in that situation and, and ask me questions and and, co and give me comments um, because. Because, uh, and I think this is important. I'll make one. I'll, I'll say one more quick thing. I think it's important to talk about the coronavirus because of how politicized, politicized it is. And if we want to come to, um, if you'll forgive the phrase, the truth about the matter, um, we really have to. Um, we, we, we really have to uh, analyze not only what we think, but what everyone else thinks. Um, and then we have to look at the evidence and, and use our critical thinking skills in order to come to um, some semblance of the truth, some semblance of a reasonable conclusion. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad that you proposed that we uh, talk about this, and I'm glad we talked about it, and I'm glad we'll talk about it in the near future. Um, so I, I hope uh, anyone out there listening, I hope you got something out of it. I know I did. Yeah, and if you guys weren't persuaded, at least I hope I brought a lot of things to your attention that were at least, uh, I guess, worthy of knowing because they are concerning, like the PCR, you know, st st stuff like that, where it's like all these ways that testing happens is really in the air and it might not even be smart. And we take all these things from granted when we hear them on the news or stuff like that. And that, that's pretty concerning if you care about having an answer that's based in anything other than partisanship. Um so I, I, I guess I'll leave that there. Um, so hopefully you gained something from this podcast. If you want to listen to more episodes, feel free to check out our back catalog. Um, you can find it on you know any of the podcatchers or on YouTube by searching The Anti-Philosopher and Beyond Talking Points. Um, I'm sure the next one we do about coronavirus will be very, very argumentative because I, uh, I think I realized that when, when you were pushing back, it just made me want to go down the rabbit hole of, of things. But I think that just might be like the, the error of the thing I'm arguing for is really I'm really arguing was arguing for the absence of government, which kind of meant if you brought up government points, I'd have to explain why they were bad. So it wasn't something I could like really touch on without going down a rabbit hole. So I think we might go into a lot of rabbit holes um, in the next one we do on COVID. But I hope you walked away at least feeling in some de to some degree more informed. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it's, it's always, it's always a great chatting with you, Matt and signing off Matt, Matt.